So welcome to the April 3rd, 2023 Zoning Board of Appeals meeting of the Town of Raymond. The Zoning Board of Appeals will come to order. The board does have a quorum. I'm now going to do a roll call, starting with myself, David Murch. Greg Dean. Tom Hennessy. Fred Miller. Kate Lockwood. Excuse me, this is a public proceeding and unless the board specifically votes to go into executive session, you have the right to hear everything that is being said and to look at all of the exhibits that are presented. Please notify the chair if you are unable to see or to hear. The board works from a published agenda and will be considering tonight's items in the following order. Number one, call to order. Number two, approval of minutes from October 18, 2022, October 25th, 2022 and November 1st, 2022. Item three, review and approval of March 18, 2023 site walk report. Number four, old business of which we have none. Number five, new business. Administrative appeal, re 402 Webbs Mills Road, applicant Sally Cheever, location 402 Webb Mills Road, owner Starat. Description, administrative appeal of commercial use. Number six, code enforcement officer communications. And then finally, number seven, adjournment. In each instance, the burden is upon the applicant to demonstrate compliance with the provisions of the applicable ordinances or state law. <clears throat> After the board votes on the merits of each application, it will prepare a written notice of decision. Because the notice of decision may substantially affect any appeals rights and also as a matter of courtesy, the board asks all of those <clears throat> ask that all of those attending the meeting with regards to a specific application not leave until the board has completed its discussion. Generally speaking, appeals from adverse decisions must be filed with the Superior Court as otherwise provided by law within 45 days of this board's decision. Also to be certain that you preserve your individual rights to file any such appeal, you must be certain that the board's record Evidence is your appearance this evening in opposition and the basis for your opposition. All persons speaking, including representatives of the, application, of the applicant and members of the public are asked to state their name, their address and their affiliation with the application, either being for, opposed or neutral. All persons speaking shall address all remarks or questions to the chair. This meeting is not over until the board has formally adjourned. Any discussion not included on the meeting agenda or accepted by the board is to be held until the adjournment, until after adjournment or conducted outside the meeting room. So uh, first up on our agenda is approval of minutes, October 18, October 25th and November 1st. Board, do we have any have you had a chance to review and do you have any comments? Looked at them, Dave, and I'm all set. I'm good. I reviewed them also, David, and I'm all set. Okay. So I have a motion then to um, accept uh, the minutes. I have a second. I'll second it. Any further discussion? So roll call vote. David Merchant in favor of accepting. Yes. Greg Dean in favor. Tom Hennessy in favor. Fred Miller, yes. B. Lockwood, yes. Okay. Item three, review and approval of the March 18, 2023 site walk reports. This was for the our property. And again, board, have you all had a chance to review? Any comments? Clarifications. I've had a chance to look at it, Dave. I don't have any questions. I've reviewed it, David, and I don't have any questions either. Okay. I'm good with that. I know, Greg, you are. Yep. So, Tom, uh, I'm assuming you're yeah. just going to go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I read it. I'm, I'm good. Excellent. So, do I have a motion to accept uh, the submitted site walk report? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All right. Any further discussion? We'll go ahead and take a vote. David Merchant, approval of accepting the site walk report. Greg Dean, approved. Tom Hennessy, approved. Fred Miller, yes. Lockwood, yes. 
Okay, next on the agenda is old business of which we have none. So we will now go into our new business. Uh, administrative appeal for uh, 402 Web Mills Road, applicant Sally Cheever, location 402 Web Mills Road, owner Starrat, description, administrative appeal of commercial use. So um, to assist the board tonight is attorney Stephen Wagner. Um, attorney Wagner, um, do you wanna go ahead and sort of introduce yourself and sort of talk through how you see things proceeding with regards to this agenda item? Sure. Uh, thank you, Chairman Merch. Uh, pleasure to see you all again uh, this evening. Uh, so uh, that all, all of you were uh, present for some prior uh, appeals, and so I'm going to suggest a uh, similar um, process uh, for going over those appeals, though, uh, given the different circumstances here and uh, it, uh, only one appeal versus eight or so. Um, and uh, a slightly less uh, evidentiary burden. I, I don't think we need to be quite as formulaic. So uh, I'll summarize how I see the evening uh, proceeding. And, uh, if, and if, of course, it's uh, at the discretion of the chair if you want to follow that approach or uh, take a slightly different approach. But um, this is a de novo hearing of a uh, decision of a code enforcement officer. So per section 6.2a, uh, it's de novo. Uh, 6.3c explains what that means, and uh, I think it does a good job of that, uh, which is essentially that the board may receive and consider new evidence and testimony, uh, be that oral or written, and the board shall hear and decide the matter afresh, undertaking its own analysis of the evidence and making factual findings, applying the law and drawing your conclusions from that. I think there are two key points to remember in a de novo review. Uh, you owe no deference to the CEO, so you can certainly assess uh, the credibility of uh, his testimony and the evidence, but you, you do not owe any particular um, deference. And uh, the second is that the appellant, the party that has brought the appeal, has the uh, burden of proof here. So uh, in terms of the sequence of presentation, uh, as our, our usual practice, uh, we have some preliminary findings to make, uh, specifically that there's a quorum, that the application is timely, complete, go over any uh, biases or conflicts, and then establish jurisdiction and standing. Uh, at that point, I suggest that we turn it over to the parties, uh, beginning with the appellant to present uh, their case without interruption, uh, allow questions of the appellant uh, by the board, and uh, then the town, should the appellant have put on any witnesses, I, I think it's fair uh, to provide an opportunity uh, for any questions from the town of those uh, particular witnesses. Uh, and then the same presentation uh, for the town, without interruptions, questioned by the board, any questions uh, of any witnesses put on by the town uh, would be appropriate at that time as well. Uh, follow that up by public comments. Any final questions from the board? And then I recommend giving a last say to both parties, starting with the uh, uh, town and ending uh, with the appellant having the final say. Uh, and at that point, you would close the public hearing and move into deliberations. Um, I suggest a similar approach that we followed last time, which is uh, making a tentative decision and instructing me to write up that decision, and then we'll come back uh, a couple of weeks from now and uh, take a vote with the benefit of that written decision. And then that vote will be the final uh, vote and I'll get the written out order out in a uh, short order. Uh, so that's the process as I, I suggest to you. Uh, any, any questions or comments from the board on that? Uh, I have two. Um... One of which is, in this case, we have a decision that was made for for non-decision you know, uh, for a property. Uh, the property owner is here. How does that person fit into this? Is there do is that public comment if they want to speak or? How's it? Uh, sure. So you know, it, it's really up to you when you want to hear from the property owner. My my suggestion is that they, they are a a member of the public and can speak during that time. But if, um, if uh, any of the other side asks uh, if, if they would like to speak during their presentations, it's up to the property owner if they want to do that. Okay. 
And my, my other question, I'm gonna leave it open for the board my fellow board members to ask questions as well of you, but um, what specifically as a board are we to make a decision on tonight? Are we to act in the role of a code enforcement officer or what ultimately are we being asked of tonight? Sure, so I think that gets a little bit into the, the jurisdiction question here. Okay. Um, so I'll, <clears throat> I'll turn to that. So your, your ordinance, um, uh, 6.2 a1 provides for an appeal of a CEO determination and uh, the appellants have cited the case called Verposa and um, essentially what that case stood for is the law court clarified that uh, Board of Appeals and then subsequently a court reviewing a Board of Appeals has jurisdiction to hear an appeal of a CEO decision to not take action. Um, so I, I agree uh, that you do have jurisdiction here, and one of this is to review the findings of the CEO or the interpretation um, of the CEO or the application of those findings to uh, interpretation of the ordinance to draw up conclusions. And so you can review those and make your determination um, afresh of whether the facts support the findings that the CEO made, whether the facts support the findings that the appellant suggests that you uh, make alternatively. Um, in my opinion, uh, based on my review of Raposa and the case law, you can uh, you would not have authority to order uh, the code enforcement officer to take uh, any particular action. You can certainly have recommendations. You can certainly give your opinion as to the findings that the CEO should or should not have made. But ultimately, the decision as to whether or not to bring an enforcement action which begins with issuing a notice of violation uh, is squarely within the jurisdiction of the CEO acting um, on behalf of the uh, select board. Uh, so in my opinion, which you're welcome to take and reject, of course, uh, the board doesn't have authority to uh, order any action of the CEO. They can simply uh, state whether or not that, you know, they agree with the CEO's findings. Okay, thank you. Attorney Wagner. Um, any fellow board members, do you have any questions at this point for Attorney Wagner? I don't have any. Okay. So, Attorney Wagner, have you? Oh, somebody just. Nope. Yep. I, I, I was just going to suggest that uh, you. Uh, I had a couple of. Um, yeah, no, let's go into, uh, I don't know if we've, we've made a determination of quorum yet. So, let's. No, well, there. I was just going to ask that uh, you sort of help us walk through those steps again you seem to have sure yep. laid out. so why don't we start with uh, establishing a quorum uh, mr chair yeah uh so we do have a quorum here tonight we have five board members all five board members are present and announce themselves during a roll call so do we need to sort of take a vote on that or do we just sort of establish it nope nope that that's good uh the next uh, issue I suggest is whether there are any uh, issues of bias or conflict uh, amongst the board that would pre uh, prevent them from inhibiting uh, participating or if they would like to uh, put to a vote of the full board. So I, I suggest first you start with board members to raise any conflicts that they think may exist or bias uh, and then uh, turn it over to the parties and uh, public to raise any issues for the board's consideration. Okay, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to the board. Uh, I myself have nothing or am aware of nothing. Fred, Pete, Tom, or Greg, go ahead and have your input. I'm not aware of any conflict, David. This I'm not aware. Tom. Yeah, I'm, this is Tom. I'm not aware of any conflict. This is Fred, and I, I'm not aware of any conflict either. You all good, Greg? You're on mute there. Classic. No conflict. Very good. So what's next, Attorney Wagner? Turn it over to the parties. Uh, yep, I've turned it over to the parties. Start with the town, then the town. Uh, I'm not aware of any conflict. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Aga Dixon. I represent the Cheevers in this appeal, and my colleague, Grady Burns, is also... Um, here and representing and uh with your permission uh we will start to present our case uh well sorry we were just uh on the 
comments on, or any comments from you folks on that if there's an allegation of bias or uh, conflict of interest. Oh, okay. I apologize. None here. Okay. And uh, from uh, the attorney for the town. Yeah, I'm Phil Saucier. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, Phil Saucier, attorney for um, the town. But in this instance, I'm I'm right here with the code officer, um, and no uh, no conflict that I'm aware of. Thank you for asking. Okay. And uh, any members from the public have uh, any uh, issue of conflict or bias to raise at this time? Okay. So seeing none, Mr. Chair, I suggest uh, you move on to determine that the application is timely and complete. Yeah, so. Uh, I have my paperwork. I do see that based on Alex's submitted response, to Grady Burns that it was submitted on January 25th. I know that by our ordinances, there's a 30 day time frame within which to appeal. And that appeal is dated February 24th by a hand delivery to the town. So that is within the 30 days. So I don't see that there's any issue with timeliness. I think we're good to go there. Okay. Do we want to just have a motion on that? <clears throat> sure. Um, so moved. Uh, <laughs> yep. Yeah. That's fine. Do we have a second? It. All right. Any further discussion board on that? So all those in approval of timing this, David Merch, yes. Greg Dean, yes. Tom Hennessy, yes. And Miller, yes. B. Lockwood, yes. Okay. So it's timely. Okay. And uh, completeness? Uh, I'll just represent that the, uh, the ordinance requires an application with the completed form, a map, if that's necessary or appropriate. Uh, typically, you see that more in a variance appeal. Uh, and uh, the requisite fees have been paid. Uh, Sandy, can you speak to the fees? Or Alex? I'm guessing probably Sandy. <laughs> yep, fees were paid. Okay, very good. Uh, and from my perspective, I've you know, reviewed everything. The board has something otherwise, but to me, it's, it is a complete application. Do we need to take a vote on that one? Uh, if you don't mind, since we're doing a remote proceeding, I like to have uh, roll call votes right. on most uh, items. Let's do it. Uh, I will propose, uh, Smith, that this is a complete and complete filed application. <laughs> do I have a second on that? Seconded. Uh, any further discussion board? All those in favor? David Merch, yes. Greg Dean, yes. Tom Hennessy, yes. Fred Miller, yes. B. Lockwood, yes. All right. It's good to go there. Okay. Next issue is I think we should have a vote to determine standing. Um, it seemed I had everybody in agreement on uh, my description of the jurisdiction. Uh, so is there a motion? Uh, to find that this board has standing pursuant to section 6.2A1 uh, to hear this administrative yeah, appeal. Really so moved. So moved. Oh, I will second it then. We know it's going to go to court probably. Um, Mr. Levitri, are you able to, to mute yourself? Yes, sorry. No, no problem. Thank you. So all those uh, in favor, David Merch, yes. Greg Dean, yes. Tom Hennessy, yes. Fred Miller, yes. B. Lockwood, yes. Okay, good to go there. All right, and the last one here is uh, standing. So uh, 6.3 E says that a uh, party aggrieved by a decision of the uh, code enforcement officer has standing to bring an administrative appeal. Um, and I'll, I'll represent to you that I, I agree with the uh, appellant's uh, interpretation and the precedent that in a butter uh, to a property subject to some action by the town, in this case, an enforcement action, uh, has uh, standing as an aggrieved party uh, to bring an appeal. Okay. So I will make a motion that uh, this appeal has standing. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion board? All those in favor, David Merch, yes. Greg Dean, yes. Tom Hennessy, yes. 
Fred Miller, yes. B. Logwood, yes. Okay. Very good. So at this point, I, I recommend uh, turning it over to uh, the appellant's attorney uh, to begin their presentation of the case. I agree. Let's, uh, is it Aga or Grady going to be? Uh... Hi, everybody. Um, I'll get started, but if you don't mind, I would love to have Grady off mute and um, uh, commenting, uh, hopefully in colorful fashion to keep things engaging and fun for the yeah. evening. Dramatically um, understating how entertaining I am, Attorney Dixon. Thank you. <laughs> that um, so, but I will get started. Um, thank you all for um, taking the time out of your uh, busy lives and busy days to, to hear our appeal. Uh, as you know, this is an administrative appeal that was submitted by the Cheevers in relation to a determination made by the Code Enforcement Officer dated January 25th of this year. And uh, we, as you know, we've submitted quite a hefty packet of information and materials um, as part of our appeal. Um, that packet dated February 24th should be in the record. And, and included in that those materials is a lot of video and audio evidence uh, that we would um, ask you to really pay attention to because I think it, that, it, that demonstrates the crux of the issues here. Um, before I get into our legal argument, and I will try to summarize what's in the packet, um, but there's quite a bit in there and I'm not going to attempt to do a whole, um, whole cloth overview. But before we get into it, I just really wanted to um, answer the question as to why we filed this appeal. And the, the answer is fairly simple. Um, it's really because no one is above the law, not even the starets, and they have not been held to the requirements of your land use ordinance. And that has been going on since at least 2015. It is 2023 now. We're approaching a decade of land use violations on this property. And that's not a small uh, statement. It, it, it's, it's not incidental. It's not minor. It has a real impact on the Cheevers daily. It had a real impact on the landowners who lived at that property prior to the Cheevers moving in. And it has a real impact on the entire neighborhood. Um, the kinds of impacts that we're going to talk about are exactly the kinds of things that your land use ordinance was created to prevent. And uh, so we're going to get into the details of all of that, but I just wanted to kind of set um, some background and walk you through, um, you know, the, the history here, because it's really important to understanding why this appeal was filed. As you probably know, it's pretty unusual for somebody to file an appeal against a code enforcement office determination. Um, but we're doing that because of the, um, the length of time that the town has really turned away from this problem and uh, the tru truly um, astounding foot dragging and um, uh, stalling tactics, for lack of a better term, that the starts have been involved in for the better part of five, six years now. Uh, so much of the much of the discussion here is not going to be a surprise. Uh, I trust that you all remember those of you who were able to attend the site walk. You all remember your observations. What we try to do is add the legal context to your own personal observations to the materials in the record. Um, and also provide you with some audiovisual um, experience to really get a sense of what the start, uh, what the achievers are dealing with on a daily basis. So, with that, if I if I could, um, I have a PowerPoint presentation that I would like to use just to guide the conversation. Uh, would it be possible to do a screen share? Um, yeah, Raymond, Tom, <laughs> someone can help with that. Post, I can um, enable it and switch it back. Okay, I will switch it to you, Alex. All I have to do is find it again. There we go.
So can you all see my screen? Not yet. Uh, I think if you want to try again. Here we go. Okay, how's that? I can see it. Yep, I see you. Okay, so um, just to you know um, to get started, as as um, uh, as your attorney explained to you, we're we're really asking you to look at the code enforcement officer's determination and uh, what I call here the no, the no violation letter and um, conclude as we have done that it's based on errors of law as well as um, not being supported by very substantial record evidence that there are actual violations on this property which have not been addressed by the uh, already issued notice of violation. Uh, this photo should look fairly familiar. This is a picture of the star at property from the boundary of the Cheever's land. And what we're, uh, what we're asking for is um, really two things. We're asking you to make your own findings and conclusions with respect to the notice uh, to the violations that we've identified. And we are asking you to order the CEO to not only issue corrected findings, but also a notice of violation and a stop work order. Um, I understand what your attorney has advised you with respect to your jurisdiction. We respectfully disagree with that. Under uh, the land use article, uh, land use ordinance article five, section I, um, the code of enforcement officer is, has specific directives. Um, you know, this ordinance was adopted by the voters of Raymond and those voters said, uh, unambiguously that the CEO shall find that any provision of this ordinance, if the CEO shall find that any provision of this ordinance is being violated, the CEO shall notify in writing the person responsible for such violations, indicating the nature of the violation and ordering the action necessary to correct it, including discontinuance of illegal use of land, buildings, structures, or work being done removal of illegal buildings or structures, and abatement of nuisance conditions. Um, the CEO has a clear directive by the voters of Raymond to identify violations and not stop there, but actually take action, take meaningful action to uh, correct the violations. And that has not been done here. So we will get back to this, but we're also asking um, you to recommend in a non-binding um, fashion, but still make a recommendation to your board of selectmen to pursue Rule 80K um, judicial enforcement action against the Starettes because these violations have, are so egregious, because they have been ongoing for almost a decade now, and because nothing that the town has done to date has stopped the um, uh, the behaviors uh, on the start property. Uh, so just in case you don't know the history of this property, I just want to go through that very quickly. Uh, the Starrets moved into the neighborhood in 2015 and by their own admission started their business that year. Um, over the course of several years, they made numerous misrepresentations to state agencies and um, clear cut their property in violation of the land use ordinance. That is all documented. I'm not making any assertions here that are not already in your record. In 2020, the prior neighbor that, that lived on the Cheever's land at the Camas complained uh, to the town of persistent ongoing land use violations. A copy of the letter that their attorney sent to the town is in the record as exhibit 1A. And it lists a whole host of violations. Um, 
some of those were um, uh, reviewed by the code enforcement officer and made part of the first notice of violation. That first NOV was issued in October of 2020, and it's also included in your packet. Um, that the CEO's determination at that point was that there were four, uh, essentially four violations on the property. One, that there was an unpermitted use um, that required conditional uh, use permits, that there were unpermitted storage structures that required building permits, that there was a violation of uh, vegetation clearing, and that no site plan approval had ever been granted for the non-residential uses on the property. Um, the Starrets took action at that point and filed a conditional use application with uh, the ZBA, with this, the former composition of this board. And this is, this is what they said. In October of 2020, they said that this, they were seeking a permit to allow them to continue to operate their family business, which is the Starrett Snow and Landscape Services, as a contractor in the town. They said that they would do their best to cooperate with town ordinances as, as they are able and be conscious of those around us to create as little disruption as possible. This is the site plan application or the uh, application um, visual that was attached to their conditional use permit. And I'd like you to remember this visual because in my view and in my mind, it stand in, stands in very stark contrast to what is actually occurring on the property. The town CBA issued um, the conditional use approval in February of 2021, and that approval is attached in uh, again as Exhibit 1C1 of our packet. I want to draw your attention to a couple of things that the ZBA said. First of all, uh, in their conclusions of law, in their findings and conclusions of law, the, the ZBA stated very specifically that the contractor use shall not generate noise, vibrations, Etc., which could be detectable at the lot boundaries. And all aspects of the use will be carried on within the structures associated or off site. They didn't make that up. That is the standard by which a conditional use permit in your town is allowed to operate. And they had to make that finding and had to effectively condition their approval on this because that's what a conditional use permit is. You can't just do it as you wash, uh, do these activities as you wish, you have to make sure that they are conditioned in such a way so that they are in harmony and not nuisances to you, their neighbors. This is after all a residential neighborhood. The other thing that the ZBA approval said was that the applicant will, they, they felt that they, were com uh, they would be comfortable approving this um, contractor use because the applicant will be unable to obtain the required site plan approval and approval from the DEP without meeting these requirements, the ones that are listed on the right. That was their justification. We feel okay with this because we know our planning board is going to hold these people's feet to the fire and make them comply with the ordinance requirements. That was in February of 2020, five years after they started the operation. In 2021, um, soon after, uh, just before that decision, the Cheapers purchased the property and a couple months into their ownership of their forever home, um, they filed a complaint to the CEO. Among other things, Sally said, you know, I have some significant issues with having to listen to heavy equipment all weekend. This was not the first time the CEO had heard this complaint. Um, it was the first time he had heard it from Sally, but certainly not the first time he had heard complaints about this property from other uh, landowners and neighbors. Um, in 2022, um, 
In June of 22, the CEO issued a second NOV that essentially reiterated the first one and told the Starettes to file a site plan application with the planning board. We are still waiting for that site plan application to be filed, by the way. Um, throughout the summer of 2022, the town took zero meaningful action and the, the Cheevers continued to lodge regular complaints with documentation of all of the violations going on on this property and complaining of severe nuisance conditions that are going on every day to this day. It was only after the town attorney sent what we call in the business a strongly worded legal letter uh, regarding all of the violations that the Starettes actually took some action. In September of 22, they filed their so-called site plan application with the planning board. And I call it so-called so because it was wholly incomplete. And the planning board found that to be the case. In, in October, a month later, they reviewed the application and sent it back as incomplete. Two months later, now we're at the end of 2022, the Star Ads finally get a consultant and their consultant sends an apologetic letter to the planning board saying, well, we, we're really busy. We don't have the capacity to do this right now. Um, so we'll, you know, we'll try to file something in April or May. That was when um, the Starrets retained us to, to um, help them with this matter. And we sent a letter to the CEO at the end of the year uh, requesting the town to take immediate action. And, um, you know, just around that time, at the end of January of this year, the CEO issued his inspection um, report noting that there were continuing violations, but declining to issue another notice of violation or take any action. Uh, right around that same time, star, the Starrets started bragging on um, social media about their firewood business. Um, and we would draw your attention to the hashtags on the social media post. So that's the history. We are here now in April of 2023 um, based on uh, you know, egregious violations and stall tactics that have been going on since basically uh, 2015 and certainly since 2020. I'm gonna turn to our um, appeal request. Uh, we had in our letter, we have essentially identified five um, violations of your land use ordinance that have not been uh, flagged as violations in the first or the second notice of violation. And we think that they are um, separate and independent bases for filing a third notice of violation and taking more meaningful action in the form of a stop work order against these individuals. So our requested findings from the CEO um, concern uh, firewood processing, uh, a junkyard, a filling, earth moving and excavation and stockpiling, um, snow removal and bulk sand storage, as well as the use of more than five vehicles for the contractor uses and activities that clearly, and as a matter of law, exceed the conditional contractor use that is allowed on this property. Uh, you know, you all, uh, or many of you were on the property and those violations were plainly visible on the sidewalk, uh, during our sidewalk. They're also plainly visible in the vast documentary evidence that we've submitted in the form of um, video recordings, audio recordings, and photography. Um, it's, it's stunning to me that the plant, uh, that the code enforcement officer's no violation letter doesn't acknowledge the existence of any of that evidence. In effect, the CEO went on a site visit after snowfall, uh, uh, when everything was covered by snow, noted a few aberrations, and uh, 
concluded that nothing was different or nothing mattered um, and no additional action should be taken here. Um, there was no acknowledgement of the fact that evidence was presented to the CEO and was never considered. And we are asking you to look at this holistically based on your own observations and based on the materials that we've submitted to date to make your own independent findings here. So um, let's get to it. Um, to understand why we think that these five additional violations exist, we really need to start with a, um, a common understanding of what a conditional contractor use actually is. And your, your land use ordinance actually gives you a lot of guidance here. Um, in Article 4D, you know, the list of permitted uses in the rural residential district, there's a list of conditional uses. One of those is um, contractors not having more than five vehicles and equipment, blah, blah, blah. So a contractor use is a conditional use. And your, your ordinance defines conditional use very specifically and very consistently with land use principles. And it says that, you know, a conditional use is something that would not be appropriate generally or without restriction throughout this area, but only okay if it's controlled as to number, area, location, or relation to the neighborhood. It's only allowed if it does that, if it promotes the public health, safety, and welfare, and so on. These uses are only allowed as conditional uses, meaning landowners don't have permission to do them as of right. Um, and that's why the Board of Appeals has to make these decisions. The CEO can't, doesn't have the authority to grant conditional uses. Uh, there's not been a lot of talk, and I, I hope you remember that because that, the crux of this issue here is the fact that the activities going on on the Starrett's property are occurring in a rural residential neighborhood, and they are causing nuisance conditions, and that is well documented. Um, I think the problem um, and the reason that action hasn't been taken is because the term contractor use is not defined specifically in your ordinance. Um, as a matter of law, that's not a problem. A lot of words are not defined in ordinances, and most ordinances, like yours, have a statement that says, if, you, if something's not divine, defined, you just use their customary dictionary meaning to figure out what it means. So we've done that, we looked to the dictionary, we figured out what a contractor is, and simply put, you know, it's, it's sort of the common sense understanding of that term. It's a person or a company that's hired by somebody else to provide construction services to a customer at the customer's project site. The activity itself does not occur at the property of the Starrets. It's supposed to occur at the customer's site. Um, if you look and recall the activities on this property, one of the major problems and one of the major violations is the um, massive firewood um, processing operation going on. When you look at your land use ordinance, firewood processing is certainly not a listed use in the rural residential district. The kinds of things you can do with a permit in this district are, um, you can have a home, you can build a church or a school, agriculture, public facilities, a bed and breakfast, boarding homes, and accessory uses to those, use, um, those kinds of activities. And the general principle of land use law is if it's not listed as a permitted use, it's a prohibited use. The firewood processing operation on this um, parcel, contrary to the Starrett's assertions, is not a residential accessory use. And it kind of defies belief that they would even say that it is. Um, and it's certainly not a contractor use. This has nothing to do with construction. 
This is an industrial use. At most, at most, it might be a use where the Starrets admittedly clear the properties of their customers and then bring it, bring that firewood back to their property to process it. I ask you to remember the definition of contractor use. Those kinds of activities are not supposed to be happening on their property. Um, and I also want to point out to you the definition of industrial use in your ordinance, which is the making of goods and articles by hand or machinery, including assembly, fabrication, finishing, packaging, and processing. This is an industrial firewood processing operation, and it is prohibited as a matter of law by your ordinance. Um, there had been some discussion about this being for personal use. Um, for something to be personal use, what that really means is it has to be accessory to the residential use of the property. And you have a definition for what that means as well. It's anything that's incidental and subordinate to the principal use or structure. Nothing about this operation in its scale, in its impact, its noise level, you name it, um, is incidental or subordinate to their residence. For one thing, um, nobody uses that much firewood to heat their home. And although the Starrets have claimed that this firewood is being hauled over to their father-in-law's property in Farmington, that's also um, defying disbelief. Here is the home of their father-in-law. It is a single family dwelling. It is a single story dwelling, roughly 1,120 square feet. Um, it is on a 14 acre lot, one acre of which is built on, the rest of it which is in tree growth. Um, I don't know anybody who owns a wood lot and heats their home with wood and doesn't cut their own wood on the property. But even if they did, it's really hard to believe that that amount of firewood, which we estimate to be around 20 to 30 quart of unprocessed wood based on the site visit that we took and another um, 13 bags, of probably six quart of processed wood that is currently on the property. It defies belief to think that that amount of wood is necessary to heat this home. And in fact, you all know this, anyone who has a wood stove knows this, it takes maybe for a large home or mid-sized home, maybe three to five quart of wood um, to heat a 2000 square foot home in the winter. So there is an illegal firewood processing operation here. It's not for personal use. And I think the evidence is very clear that that's the case. The second um, category of illegal activity here has to do with mineral extraction and all of the associated filling, earth moving, excavation, and stockpiling that's going on. Again, going back to your, um, the, your ordinance, if it's not permitted, it's prohibited. Here, at most, you might argue that this activity is a mineral extraction operation. But even if you did that, that requires a conditional use permit, and they've certainly not received that here. We have ample evidence in the record that, um, that the, um, there has been extensive removal of topsoil, rock, sand, gravel, and other earthen materials from this property. And it, it's, it's a constant activity of bringing soils onto the property and moving them around. If, a, if the meaning of contractor use, uh, if, there's a, if a contractor use is supposed to be conditional so that it's in harmony with the surrounding uses, the interpretation cannot be that these uses are allowed, these kinds of, this level of activity on the site is allowed. You also uh, uh, have seen that we've, um, you know, we've made note of the fact that there have been some pretty substantial snow removal operations in the past on this property uh, and associated bulk storage of sand, sand and salt. 
And um, again, if it's not permitted, if it's not listed in Article 4D, it's prohibited. This is again a situation where the, the level and scope of this activity is not associated with residential use. It's not a contractor use. It is not even related to offsite construction work. It's a separate business. And, you know, the fact that they tell us that they won't do any more plowing doesn't mean that the violation hasn't occurred. It has occurred. Um, lastly, I just want to point you to draw your attention to the definition of a junkyard. We also talk about this in our filing. Um, a junkyard is defined under state law as any yard, field, or other outside area used to store, dismantle, or otherwise handle discarded, worn out, or junked plumbing, heating supplies, electronic, or industrial equipment, household appliances, or furniture discarded scrap and junked lumber. I will re refresh your memory. If you don't recall that during our site walk, we saw plenty of piles of junk that fit within this definition. Um, and this is a situation where, you know, your ordinance is quite clear that junk junkyards are not allowed in this district. They're only allowed in the industrial district. And uh, more importantly, any unlicensed junkyard is specifically deemed a nuisance under your ordinance and must be abated within a year of passage of your ordinance. That has certainly not occurred here. Um, there has been some activity, as you know, by the Code Enforcement Office to uh, um, try to bring the Starrets into compliance with their contractor use um, by um, uh, encouraging them to file first a ZBA application and then a planning board uh, application. We're not challenging that part of the notice of violation. We agree that those are violations. We agree that the Starrets have to file a site plan application and get approval for that in order to continue the contractor use. But those issues don't have to be resolved for this board, for the ZBA to decide based on the evidence and the plain language of your ordinance that there are activities here that simply exceed the scope of the contractor use that would be allowed if they were to grant, if the planning board were to grant site plan approval for it. And you know, we've talked about what a conditional use means. Um, I've talked to you about the definition of contractor. We have submitted all kinds of photographic evidence of the types of equipment that are on this property. And then on top of that, here's a listing of all of the things we saw during the site visit. I mean, again, it defies comprehension that uh, somebody could go on this site and conclude that this is a contractor use and that all is good. Um, I will. Just to, you know, when you get these situations where you have a neighbor complaining about an activity, it's very easy to sort of get into the mindset of like, oh, you know, here's another NIMBY. They just, they just want um, to cause trouble or prohibit some kind of activity that's bothering them. Um, you, 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 none of you had the opportunity to really live through um, the nuisance conditions that are on this property. Uh, so if you bear with me, I have a little bit of an audio compilation of observations of the Cheevers at the property boundary over the course of the past year. Um, and I, if you bear with me, I'd like you to just listen to the whole thing. It's about five minutes long. I realize that's a long time, but I think it's very important. So I'm going to turn that on here. We're not getting any audio coming through, Aga. Let me see if I can fix that. Thank you, Grady.
Is that coming through? Nothing currently. been all day again. We're back to working on site all day. I'm pretty sure it's clean up for the walkthrough, um, but they are doing excavation, which is alarming to me. So, 
This equipment has been running all day. I wonder what the runoff from that is. Um, we do have standing water in our yard that never used to be here before. Um, there's a like a gully in between our two properties and there's standing water. That should have given you a five minute sense of what Sally and Ed live with and their neighbors, frankly, live with every day in the mornings, during the day, in the evenings, and on the weekends. Um, I would not have taken on this case. I'm, you know, my usual MO is to work as a town attorney. I, I do private land use law when, um, when I get conflict work, and this was a situation. Uh, I would not have taken on this case personally if I did not think that there were very egregious violations here. And that's why I agreed to represent the Cheevers. And I ask you to put yourselves in them, their shoes when you make your decisions about this matter. They have been living with this um, these nuisance conditions for well over two years now. And their prior uh, homeowners moved away because they couldn't stand it. Um, we are asking you for a very simple thing, which is to instruct the code enforcement officer to do his job and to pursue these violators in the same way that any violator of a land use ordinance in Raymond should be pursued. So I'm happy to take any questions um, or I can um, pass it on to the town. So attorney Wagner is, is now the, the time for us to ask questions or should we? Yes. Okay. Um, I do have one question. Uh, do you have any evidence with regards to the firewood processing that it's being sold? Um, yes. I mean, common sense indicates that they're not just giving this stuff away. Um, but more to the point, your ordinance doesn't require it to be sold. It's not a use that's allowed. There's nothing that says that so long as you sell it, all of a sudden it becomes okay, uh, okay. or not okay. But specific to my question, do you have any evidence that is being sold? We have um, presented you with the evidence that we have on the firewood processing, which is the scope of the operation. Uh, whether or not, um, the Cheevers, uh, uh, the the Starrets are making money off of selling the property uh, of firewood. I don't have anything specific to that. We do have statements from the Starrets and uh, evidence from social media, as I've demonstrated that um, the Starrets are acquiring the firewood from their commercial sites. And if they're doing that, that means that they are as part of their a consideration for the job, uh, for the construction job or the site clearing job or 
you know, the septic installation job offsite, they're being compensated in kind by being given this firewood, but it's not a donation, it's part of the deal. Okay, thank you. So we do have additional uh, photograph, I have something to say. Um, we do have additional photographic evidence of different trucks coming up. Um, I think it was misrepresented by um, uh, Nicole that they only come and pick up the firewood. Um, on mute, Sally. There you go. So we we do have pictures of various different trucks coming to pick up pallets of wood. Um, if you look at the picture, I think that's on their application. Um, you can see there are about 35 of those pallets of wood, and that was taken in November. And now there are maybe 10 pallets left there. Um, I don't know what else is happening with that wood. Um, it's being distributed, and that's the concern. It's being mass produced and distributed. I can't speak to whether they're getting money for that or not, but the, the, the volume of activity that goes on over there is definitely not for personal use. You'd have to be running a crematorium to go through that much wood, I think. Okay, thank you. Uh, fellow board members, do you have questions? Uh, verbal yes or no would be good. None from me, David. Okay. None from me, Tom. None from me, Dave. Um, so, Attorney Wagner, I think we're we're good. For sure. Would, would you mind if I asked a question? No, please, Mister. Um, I guess uh, my question, uh, Attorney Dixon, is: Does it does it is the relevant question? What was the uh, Conditional use, scope of the conditional use applied for and approved is is that relevant here, or does this board make a determination all on its own as to what a uh, or sorry a contractor use is and what isn't a contractor use, um, or are they restricted by what this board determined three or so years ago was a contractor use? Um, I think the answer is yes and yes, Stephen. Um, you know. The, the permit that was issued by the predecessor ZBA um, authorized a certain amount of activity on this property under the category of contractor use. The ZBA never defined that term, but they put bookends on what it means through their conditional approval. And so they said, you know, no, this use is not allowed to create noise beyond the boundaries of the property. Um, and under this zoning ordinance, the CEO is supposed to enforce violations of permit approvals. So one point that we make is that the co conditional use approval itself has been violated, and that is not recognized in the notice of violation. And separate from that, there are all these activities that fall beyond the scope of what a conditional um, contractor use actually is based on the um, language of the and the plain language of the ordinance. Uh, so I think it's a twofold um, problem. One is that they have what the Starrets have exceeded the scope of their conditional use approval. And two, they have and continue to conduct activities on the property that. Um, as a matter of law, fall outside of the definition of contractor use. Thanks. I have nothing further, uh, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, is it, uh, do we allow uh, the town, well, the uh, CEO's attorney to, to address any questions at this point? Or? Sure. Well, so I, I left that opportunity open if there was, uh, you know, any any witnesses uh, that, that were introduced, but uh, there, there wasn't really that here. But uh, certainly you can give uh, the attorney for the town an opportunity if he had any questions of uh, that he wanted to ask directly. Um, if not, uh, it would just proceed into his uh, presentation. 
Very good. So, Attorney Saucer, if you want to ask questions, please do so. And if I uh, want to proceed, that'd be great too. Thank you, Chairman Birch. I have no questions, and I'll, we'll just sort of launch into a description of notice of violation. And and the CEO is really going to kind of just walk you through his process as um, that he that he goes through as he receives complaints and investigates them um, and his conclusions. So I'm going to let the CEO um, go over that in a moment. I just wanted to quickly kind of uh, respond or sort of frame up where the where I think it is. I where I think you are here tonight. As an initial matter, I agree with your attorney that that it is a de novo appeal. In other words, you're making a decision on whether the whether the allegations that uh, the neighbors have raised um, are a uh, constitute a violation of land use ordinance. That's all you're doing. I, I do not agree with Attorney Dixon that you have the authority to order the issuance of an NOV. That may that may flow if you if you rule um, the other way, but but the board is not an enforcement body, and so the CEO uh, clearly has that authority under your ordinance. But what you do have the authority to do is determine if the CEO was incorrect in his interpretation. So it's a distinction I just want to make, and I, so I agree with your attorney's advice on on that particular issue. Um, uh, the other thing I just want to do is to make sure we're we're uh, focusing on what what you're here to review, for at least from my perspective. What you're, and I think Terry Dixon just clarified it a bit, and I agreed with how she said it. But what I want to make clear it's not about the the prior notices of violation. Those are those have been issued. Um, they have been partially resolved and not resolved, depending on the particular issue of those notice violations. Those are out there. So it's not about that, and it's it's, it's not about that particular planning board process at this point. It's also not about the prior conditional use approval. I think we, tr I heard that last presentation trended a bit into essentially arguing about that conditional use approval and whether the, the conditional use here is allowed and maybe should have been granted. That, that decision has been made and was not appealed in 2020. And the code officer certainly has no authority to disregard that approval from the zoning board um, uh, back in 2020. So. There is a conditional use for contractor use on this property that is not at issue today. From what I understand, the argument is, is that they're arguing that essentially what's going on there exceeds the scope of what was approved um, in 2020. And they're also now making new allegations that there are additional violations beyond the scope issue. So I think just to narrow it down and make sure we're not uh, inadvertently attacking a prior approval that it's far too late to attack at this point, uh, three years out. Um, so that's that's it. Just to kind of set the stage, I think it's it's really a, a, it's your decision essentially tonight. So the CEO is just going to really describe his process and what he did when he investigated it and where he came to conclusions. And it's your decision to determine um, if there is a violation. So with that, I'll leave to Alex to go through your decision, and I may sort of step in at the end to wrap it up. Board, uh, my name is Alex, code officer for the town of Raymond. Um, Give a complaint. Um, we take those complaints in and they are reviewed. And typically, in most cases, an inspection will either be um, done or scheduled with the property owner. Uh, if a violation is found, uh, as you know, uh, a notice of violation will be issued. And we have, um, you know, Typically, our first approach is to try and, and resolve any issues before we need to go to the, the point of needing to issue a notice of violation. Um, but in most cases, we send that first notice, which gives uh, the violator 30 days to bring the property into compliance. Now, that NOV will include the specific violations, um, the ordinance sections, and what's required in order to correct the violations. And then it also includes the um, appeals language at the end. Um, if we don't get a response or the violation is not resolved, um, typically the second notice um, as quickly as possible. But if someone is showing intent to comply you know, or realistic intent to comply, that might not occur within 30 days or 60 days. It might, might, might take longer. Um, such as in this case where it was, um, you know, a period of time after that first NOV. A compliance after that second NOV, uh, what will typically take place is I will essentially recommend that uh, particular violation to the select board. So the select board is the entity that runs the town 
that has the authority to actually take enforcement action against a violator. As a code officer, I am not able to find anyone or actually take anything beyond just those final, you know, the, the last notice of violation. Um, uh, it's up to the select board to make that decision to take someone to court, assess fines, and, and do all of that. Once it goes to the select board, um, you know, I'm not involved in that decision. I don't have a vote. I can essentially just, um, you know, make my recommendations to the select board and be there, obviously, as a witness. Um, you know. kind of just a process from, from, you know, my point of view, how we typically do things, um, you know, in our office. For this particular situation, um, there, there is open violations um, on site. This is kind of an unusual one because, um, to be honest, to, to say it plainly, um, we're kind of on the same side here. Um, you know, there's been you know numerous violations that have taken place, uh, as um, shown by the two NOVs that have been sent. Um, and the town would like to see this brought into compliance. Um, it is obviously a, a significant disruption to abutters, um, as shown by you know, some of the photos and videos that um, the achievers have sent in. Um, you know, I've spoken to uh, quite a few abutters over the years um, on this particular property. You know, one of the things that I think was shown in the presentation was the period of time that has taken place. Um, you know, I think they, they purchased the property in 2015 and um, you know, we're still here kind of discussing this today. Um, I started uh, with the town of Raymond in July of 2020. The first NOV went out uh, October 2020. Um, so there's you know, three months or so after I started that we started um, enforcement on this. Um, so I do kind of, you know, I, I don't want to get personal about it, but I do take a little offense when people say that the code officer hasn't done anything because there wasn't anything done for you know, five years or so until I started. So um, I do think that um, we wanna see this corrected. Um, it has gone to the select board and the select board, um, you know, has, has their own opinions and point of views on, on you know, the situation. Um, so I can't speak for them, but so it has kind of hit that end mark for, you know, what the code officer can do. Um, so speaking specifically about the, the uh, the complaint that was received. Um, I can go through, you know, each one of these if you guys want, um, and kind of give you my my thoughts on what it is that we viewed the day when we went over to do the inspection. If you guys feel that would be helpful, um, and I did have uh, my assistant Chris Hansen with me the day of to make sure we had multiple eyes on this to make sure that we didn't miss anything. Um, you know, talking with uh, Nicole, um, we were both able to kind of take photos and, and take notes and stuff on that. Does the board think it would be helpful for me to go through that? Hey, Alex, this is Tom and, and David. Could, before we go into that, could we ask for a two minute break? Yes, yes Tom, we can, we can have a two minute break. So we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll take a two minute break. Starting now, we'll be back uh, at uh, I show eight nineteen. So let's be back by eight twenty two, Tom. So now we're back from our break. Board, do you would you like to have uh, Alex go through a, a brief review of his how he came to his determinations? I, th I personally think it'd be very helpful. Yeah, I, I'm, I agree. I, I agree. I, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I think it would be good. And, and Alex, if if you could, I, I, I mean, I have the I have the report in front of me, so I, I do understand what was written up. Um, but I guess you know, as you go through it, sort of your thought process, and also if you could too, I do see that Chris Hansen was there with you. If you could just let us know, you know. Did Chris at any point have a difference of opinion or anything like that? Um, yeah, I mean, to answer that question, this this um, written summary is the 
um, I guess, summary of both Chris and I's opinions on this. So uh, it wasn't necessarily a difference in opinion. It was um, you know, kind of a joint effort between the two of us uh, on that. So uh, no, I don't think there was anything that there was a difference of opinion. Um, I will say Chris, uh, I think Chris had a, a, I think the stronger opinion about firewood and, and his point, um, cause I'll start with that. We'll get right into it. His point was, um, it's a very common thing for property owners to process, uh, firewood on their properties. Uh, in fact, at 200 feet to my left, I have a neighbor that also, um, has a small, uh, rig where he chops up his own firewood and has multiple cords of wood stored. Um, so it is, uh, it is a very common thing that does happen. Um, so on site, we did notice that there was, um, you know, raw logs, um, there was machinery to process, um, the firewood or actually chop the firewood. And then there was, um, a few of the, uh, you know, bags of, of wood that appeared to have been chopped. We did speak with Nicole, um, about this and, you know, she advised us that, um, this wasn't for for sale. Um, they do this for their own personal use. The wood does, she did say, does come from job sites um, and is brought to the property. Um, but uh, you know, she did not admit to selling any of this. And uh, I don't have any evidence that they are selling any of this. Um, so it, it's definitely um, you know, one of those things where I could see, you could easily say that this is part of their current operation, their current business, which is essentially a property services business, you know, landscaping, snow removal. Um, they're doing all sorts of different property services. That's excavation, um, you know, and that can include also um, tree removal. Uh, and a product of tree removal is logged. So, um, you know, there is an existing violation on site, which is a contractor use that's not, um, gone through the process to receive site plan approval. Uh, um, that's really it for our conversations about the firewood. Um, we did notice that there, there was materials stockpiled on site, um, which according to the property owner were brought in from other jobs. Um, it appeared to be loam um, and rock mostly. Um, no no uh, processing is done on site. Um, I wasn't able to find any machinery on site that looked to be used for, um, you know, processing gravel or, or uh, a screener or anything like that. Um, it's possible they have done that at some point in time, but when we did the inspection, you know, there was none of that on site the day of. Um, so, I mean, I'm not sure they may have done it last year and, and, and you know, equipment, I don't know. But the day that we did the inspection, um, there was none of that down there. Um, the referenced for the mineral extraction, I guess I'm somewhat confused. Um, it appears as though that, I mean, that section, as far as I can tell, is extracting material out of the ground. I didn't see any evidence of that being done on site. If anything, it's the opposite. The materials being stored on site, brought in from elsewhere. It doesn't look as though they're running this as a gravel pit. They're not pulling anything out of the ground. And that's the section of the ordinance that was referenced. So um, I guess I'm not following that um, you know, specific complaint. Are they moving material on site? It does appear as though a significant, a significant amount of impervious surface has been created. Uh, and that was done a number of years ago. And that is included on the NOV, um, which does require site plan approval as well. Um, that could be separate from the contractor use because someone could clear over 10,000 square feet in their backyard um, just to store their toys. Um, and they may still need site plan approval for that, even if they're not a contractor. But in this particular case, the damage was done. Um, they need to correct it after the fact by either uh, revegetating or getting the proper, proper permits. Um, and neither have been done at this point. Um, the snow removal piece of this, um, Nicole stated on site that they're no longer providing snow removal services. Um, there was some equipment stored down there. Um, I don't know if they are actually providing snow removal services or not. I know there was a sign on the property, um, you know, a year or two ago, that sign is no longer. Um, I have not personally heard anything, you know, from anyone about them uh, using the stairs for snow removal. 
I'm not sure, to be honest, um, on that. Um, there was a small pile of sand stored in one of the carport structures, approximately two to three yards, um, which uh, was actually uh, sand and salt mixed, I believe. Um, the town does not require a permit for salt storage. Uh, it's not something in the land use ordinance. Um, there may be you know, numerous individuals in town that, that have a sand and salt storage area. I'm not sure, but in this particular case, um, I was expecting to be honest, to see um, in the area of a hundred plus yards, um, what we saw was, was actually a really small area of storage. That was the day we did the, this inspection. I don't know, you know, today it could be more, it could be less, but uh, when we did the inspection, which was shown in the photos, that's how much we found. Uh, large equipment is still being stored on site, um, which uh, is in these large carport structures, which are legal. Um, they're not permitted structures. Um, there's no building permit. There's no site plan approval uh, for those. Um, there is a fuel storage tank in one of these structures. As far as I'm aware, um, there is no permit in place for that fuel storage. Um, Nicole did state uh, on site the day of that she was going to contact the state to see what needs to be done to keep her in compliance with the fuel storage rules. Um, and I know there's been some um, back and forth on that, I think with uh, the Cheever's attorney, maybe talking with the state, I'm not sure if there's been any developments there. Um, I, I did notice there was a small area of fuel spillage um, near the tank, but I'm a very small area. I mean, if, you know, maybe you know, three or four square feet of ground covered uh in that um you know that carport structure um there was not a large amount of um equipment stored outside of these structures um i gather from the videos and photos i've seen that this is an ongoing um you know daily change uh they may have equipment there in the morning that's not there in the afternoon um so I don't know the day we were there, um, you know, based you know on the photos that I provided, that's what it looked like uh, when we went down. Like I said before, they they are still in violation of the contractor use uh, with the contractor use. Um, you know, one of the things that that contractor use does state it was somewhat misleading, I think, in Attorney Dixon's presentation. Um, they're not limited to just five pieces of equipment. It's there's a screening requirement. They can only have five that are not screened. They can actually have much more than five. There's no limitation on that, but I think that was kind of somewhat misleading the way it was presented. Um, but regardless, they're still in violation of that particular section at the moment anyways, because they don't have their site plan approval. Um, it, from what we saw, you know, the day that we did our inspection. Oh, one more thing. I did want to talk about the junkyard stuff. There was snow on the ground. I was really mostly slush actually the day we did the inspection about you know six inches or so of slush um, we were able to kind of get off into the far corner of the property um, which was i believe uh, from what i've heard previously a wetland area um, it does look as though that wetland area has been filled or impacted to to some extent um, as far as i'm aware this is a forested wetland which you actually can impact an area of a forested wetland um, and actually you could do it without a permit from the town in this particular zone. Um, you can fill with aggregate materials. That could be cement, that could be um, tar, you could use gravel, sand. Um, you, could, um, you could do all of that. What you can't do is um, you know, various metals um, are one of the things you can't. Um, I didn't see anything the day we did the inspection that was on the list included with the junkyard uh, in the state statute description, uh, definition for a junkyard. Um, like I said, there was still, it was winter, uh, there was still snow on the ground. So we could do a reinspection um, of the property and, and determine that, um, you know, based on the uh, description from the site walk, it sounds like there may still be concerns with that. So we could take a look at that to, to see exactly what's going on with, um, you know, with um, if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them for you. I do have a question. So um, you had mentioned that um, you uh, tried to, yeah. 
<laughs> no, no, I don't. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. I think we're going to take the board, take an opportunity to to ask Alex some questions and such, okay. and then we'll figure out your pro the right placement for you to 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 ask questions uh, about Alex. I, Just before do that, Mr. Chair. Yeah, go, go ahead, Alex. I do want to give Phil a chance to follow up. He did want to chime in again at the end. Yeah, after sure. I before we yep, open up. I agree. And I was actually going to see if Phil did want to have some follow up. Uh, thank you. I don't have a lot of follow up. I think Alex has kind of walked through the process. I would sort of reiterate the sort of limited part of your review, but um, and, and also just to kind of really second what Alex said. I think the reason why we wanted to go through the process is um, is although it's a de novo review, we want to make sure the board understood that the CEO's office has, takes these complaints in. They they take them seriously. He's issued two NOVs already. On, on existing violations. The board of selectmen have you know, directed me a year ago to issue a letter, which we did. And obviously there's been no enforcement action in court. And that's partly because they're going through a site plan review process, um, which we'll need to conclude at some point. But, but that's the process that's gone through. And so I did, wanna, I did really just um, wanna push back a little bit on Attorney Dixon's um, presentation about the code officer's job duty. Now you can disagree with him and that's a different thing. But 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 he but the code office has taken these complaints. They they take them in, um, you know, from residents on a daily basis and always and always process them. So that's where we'll leave it. Um, I think his determination speaks for itself, and his description speaks for itself at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, board. Did you have any questions specific to Alex or Attorney Sauce here? Um, if you can have a verbal yes or no, I don't have any questions right now for Alex or Phil. I've got a couple questions, David. Yeah, please, Greg. <clears throat> hey, uh, I'm not sure who I should direct this to, but I'll direct it to Phil, and Phil can uh, hand it off if if he'd like. How's that um, sound? Is that the right process? But um, I'm curious about the town's, um, given the location of the property, uh, with respect to the town, town's own property, and noise was seemingly a substantial part of uh, the issue raised tonight. Um, it didn't seem to be addressed. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming it wasn't observed during the site walk. It would sort of make sense that they wouldn't be also, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, violating their conditional use while you're on the property. But I, I was curious if, if, you know, if it's something that has been also observed um, at, at other points in time, or, or um, if you could just comment or the town could comment on uh, the perception of the sound as it relates to the evidence that was presented. Yeah, um, right, Alex. I, I guess, um, are you asking if we, as an abutter, also um, hear activity down there? Yeah, we are so close. Yes, basically. Yeah, yeah it's a great question. Um, and it's not a, an easy answer, I guess, because um, during the day, uh, I don't frequently hear any activity from the site. However, we are kind of uphill. Um, pretty far from the area that they are doing the work, much further uh, from the actual site than the Cheevers are. So I don't think we would hear much. Um, the other thing is from what um, I've seen, it, it seems to be they do uh, more in the morning and um, at the end of the day at night. I don't know if it's they're leaving and then they're coming back. Um, so Chris Hansen, my assistant, typically is in the office much earlier than me, and then I come in, and then I stay later, and he leaves. So we kind of have overlapping hours, and he will typically notice that there's trucks pulling out in the morning, uh, a lot of activity coming in and out of the property. But do we actually hear, you know, the backup alarms and stuff like that? No, we don't hear a lot of that. But I think it's mostly because we're uh, a little further away. Okay, and when you when you um... Is there anything preventing the town from trying to observe, like like moving a little bit closer? Uh, like it seems like you could like walk across the street, and still be on the, you know public property, and be close to a close to a. Is there any or is there any like uh, pro, do is there any like process that would prevent the town from doing something like that, or does it, do you have to be announced and before you show up? I can answer that. No, you, you don't have to be announced because I, I think what you're getting as the standard is um, out of the, you know, at the property line or beyond. So you can observe something, you know, from your property line. 
he what, what he would have to do is if you uh, to go on a site would have to get permission um, or an inspection warrant from the court if he's denied. And so that in this case, he's had voluntary compliance in terms of the inspections. If, if he's ever denied, then we've helped CEOs go to court and we get an inspection warrant. So that's the way to do it. Um, so there, there but he has, has, not to, has not to do that at this point. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. I understand. Thanks. So, but just to re, just to clarify, so there has to be a denial before you could get a warrant. So you couldn't just show up and say, "I want to see what's going on." You can't just go on. He can't just go onto someone's okay. property like that. No. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Um, and then I just just if you could comment a little bit more. I mean, you mentioned the junkyard being um, obscured. Uh, I'm not. You know, I don't know what the ground cover was like when when you were there. Uh, can you just describe in general? I mean, we, what 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 the we, we observed, you know, it was a lot of snow and we, we couldn't see much. Um, and do, do you think that in, impacted your overall ability to assess some of the, some of the uh, specific complaints? Um, no, I, I mean, I don't think, um, you know, what, what the, the complaint specifically stated was, um, I believe construction debris um, is the term I recall. Um, I think from what I can remember, there was a, um, set of concrete stairs that are partially buried. Um, and I am trying to pull up the pictures here because I think I have a picture of it, but um, that uh, could be considered construction debris, but at the same time is also concrete material. So it may be okay. Um, looking at the junkyard definition, um, you know, discarded, worn out junk plumbing, heating supplies, electronic or industrial equipment, household appliances or furniture, um, didn't see any of that, um, discarded scrap or junk lumber, didn't see any of that, old uh, scrap copper, brass, rope, rags, batteries, paper trash, rubber debris, waste, and all scrap iron, steel, or other um, scrap metal. I, I didn't see any of that. I, I believe there was something described uh, somewhere saying that there's rebar um, included in this uh, fill area. I didn't see any when we did our inspection. Um, but again, now that the snow is melted, uh, I would be willing to do a follow-up inspection uh, to take a look if, if um, the property owner would be willing to allow that. Um, that's all I've got, David. Thanks. Thank you, Greg. Hey, David, this is Tom. I have a couple of questions for Alex. Sure, Tom. Um, Alex, off the top of your head, um, do you know of any permits that have been issued for the starts and either structures or home occupation business or anything besides the conditional use? So they received the conditional use approval. Um, there's no permit in place for any of the carport structures, the temporary structures that are in the back portion of the property. Uh, there is a permit, I believe, for a driveway um, from... 2015, 16, 17, somewhere in there off the top of my head. Um, and the recent work done to the house is permitted uh, to the residential structure. Um, but none of the, uh, you know, the actual structures down below are permitted. Now there's two, I believe, older wooden structures. I believe those have been around for a while, um, but uh, I'm not sure off the top of my head, to be honest, if those are, are legal or not. Okay, and, and my other question is, is there any other similar contractor business in, in Raymond's LRR zones anywhere? Uh, legal? <laughs> oh, either or, I guess. Uh, I believe there are others that are, are operating. Um, however, I'm not sure of any of them ever getting conditional use approval for that. They may have, I don't know. I. I I have never come across a conditional use approval for uh, contractor use, but my gut tells me that it's in the ordinance for a reason. Uh, and it may be that they were trying to uh, legalize something or prevent something. Um, but I'm not aware of any off the top of my head in this particular district. Okay, and just a comment. I, I believe I watched this um, original conditional use ZBA meeting and the, the promise of the noise was one thing, but it was also that all the work would be done on other people's sites. They were just keeping their trucks there and doing snow plowing out on the roads and, 
and landscaping was always done at other people's sites. So um, it sounds like it's gone a little bit further than that in recent years. Brad, Pete, you have a couple of questions, David. Um, one, I think uh, in reading the notes and the uh, information that was provided, that the permit that was provided for the uh, driveway was for like residential and not commercial. And uh, I just think that we should uh, understand that and have clarification of that. Um, and then, uh, Alex, if we could go back to, you, you provided us some clarification as far as the number of vehicles or pieces of equipment that were allowed to be on the property screened or not screened. On the day that we did our site visit, we saw no less than six trailers, a front end loader, a large excavator, and several pieces of equipment uh, throughout the, uh, the property. How would you count them? I mean, we did see, obviously, a couple of tractors, a couple of dump trucks inside the covers, the unpermitted covers, but all this other equipment that was out on the property and exposed how would you count that based on the information? Yeah, and that's a challenge because um, you know someone might have a, a, a lawnmower that they use that's their own personal lawnmower. Um, but if you're in a landscape business, I don't think you can you can say you know these three lawnmowers are for my own personal use. Um, you might be able to say one is, but uh, realistically, I think I'd lean more towards a lot of the, the uh, landscape equipment or excavation equipment would have to be counted. Um, a significant majority of that would have to be counted. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so, and I think that's all part of the contractor use, uh, the, the illegal contractor use for sure. You had another question too, I think. Well, you had yeah, I have another question. And that is that, again, during our site visit, we saw uh, a pile of uh, old trusses that were just stacked up on the property and an old deck that looked like it had been removed from a house and was just sitting over on the kind of the wetland area of the property. Um, how would you uh, describe that as far as junkyard or not being part of a junkyard? That could possibly meet the definition of a junkyard if it's construction materials. Um, like if you were to demolish a house, and they were to, you know, or demolish a, a shed, for example, and bring it into this property and try to bury that uh, in the well. And that would be um, something that could fall under the definition of a junkyard for sure. Again, that wasn't something that I saw the day I did the inspection and we wrote this letter, um, but that could very well, um, you know, be on site right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, I got a, at least one question. Um, if I understand this, this a couple of violations right now, that, that you have sent out one letter and then a second letter, is that correct? Yes, we've sent two NOVs um, for this and it has actually gone before the select board or gone to the select board uh, for enforcement. Mm -hmm. Now, are you, as far as your part, can you do like one more letter or once you turn that over to the select board that, that it's out of your hands? At this point, the only letter I would write would say that it's been you know, handed to the select board. Um, but the letter that Phil Saucier sent um, in August is essentially what that letter would say. It's just typically says, you know, the select board may um, decide to take enforcement action and it says fines. Um, if we were to notice any new violations, that would be a new NOV in my mind, which would have a new appeal period. Um, and then we'd have to be careful about duplicative violations as you guys have dealt with quite a bit in the past. Um, if we're going to send a new NOV that includes a contractor use as well, um, we could run into a situation if this does go to court and now the town has two different sets of fines because of multiple uh, NOVs, multiple violations, which might be considered the same violation. So um, I don't know. I guess we'd have to really talk about what the goal here is because um, it seems the complaint has been that, you know, the code office hasn't done enough, hasn't done enough. The letters haven't done anything. I don't know that sending another NOV is really going to do anything else uh, at this point. So I guess to follow up on that, so what would be the town's next um, action? Is that, is that for to file something with the courts or? Yeah, I, I can take What's that the time yeah, period so, there? So that's, yeah, that's something for the select board. It's not in your jurisdiction tonight. And, and the court actually, the, uh, the Raposa court, which is the court that um, your attorney said gives you the jurisdiction tonight, made that very clear. So there's a footnote in their decision saying, even though there's an ability to appeal 
determination of a code officer that there was not a violation or there was, ultimately the municipal officers in the, in the community have the discretion to bring enforcement action. So I would say that's not even in your purview this evening in terms of how the town's going to prosecute or not prosecute the, the ongoing violations. It's simply, are there violations as, a, as alleged today, um, the new violations as they laid out? That's, that's what you're here for tonight. But basically right now, Alex's hands are tied, right? He's done as basically as far as he can go. In terms of the, the violations that he has found. That's right. The, tonight is about new alleged violations. That's all I got. Uh, Attorney Wagner, uh, who do we turn this over to next? <clears throat> um, you, you can turn it over to uh, questions from the uh, appellant, and I'd suggest starting with uh, uh, the appellant's counsel. Um, they can direct from there how they want to approach uh, the opportunity to ask questions of the code enforcement officer. Okay, very good. So, Attorney Dixon, I'll, I'll direct it to you first. Okay, thanks. Um, Attorney Wagner, just clarification, can we provide some rebuttal argument here or would you like, ask, uh, like us to hold off? Uh, it, it, it's your choice. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest that the chair give you an opportunity after public comment to provide rebuttal. Um, so if you want to save it to them, uh, that makes sense. Okay. Um, I, I do have a couple of questions for, uh, for you, Alex, if you don't mind. Um, one thing, you know, first of all, I just want to make clear, like, we're not suggesting that you haven't done your job. Um, we just disagree with the conclusions that you've reached in your note in your latest no violation letter for the reasons that I explained. So, uh, you know, it's not it's not like we don't like you. <laughs> just want to put that on the record. Um, the issue that I want to ask you about is it sounded as when I read through your letter, it sounded to me like you had not given much uh, consideration, if any at all, to the, you know, significant amount of evidence that we provided as to what was going on on the property. Um, and that that struck me as unusual because I don't I don't think you're limited in your job to just observe through your own eyes. You can consider other evidence, including photographs taken by other people and video taken by other people to determine whether a violation has occurred. So why, why didn't you look at that evidence and when drawing up the letter? I did, I think the end result is still the same. I think it's still a contractor use, um, which is currently illegal. So I, I mean, I think ultimately the end result is the same. There's a violation. Um, I, I am not going to, as you pointed out earlier, because there's no clear, I guess, definition in our ordinance about what a contractor use is, I don't think it's um, in the town's best interest if I am you know, deciding which parts and pieces of a landscape business are separate businesses. Um, if it's a property service businesses or a property service business, um, I don't think I can, you know, really decide what is a firewood business, what is an excavation business, what is a snowplow business, what is a uh, lawn mowing business. I think they are all one contractor use. Um, and so I don't think there is any additional violation there. Um, the other question I had for you was, um, uh, and this is really going to something that uh, one of the select, uh, one of the boards of appeals members asked is whether you know, what happens next or, you know, what's the point of, of this appeal? And I just want to make it clear to everybody, and I, I think you'll agree with this, that, you know, the select board can't take enforcement action unless there's a finding of a violation, right? So the, the reason we filed this appeal was to get that finding of a violation so that the select board could make the decision as to whether or not to file judicial enforcement action. That's fine. Is that, a, is that a question? Yeah, I mean, it sounded to me like there, there was a back and forth that somehow, you know, Alex's hands were tied here, but I don't think that's the case. I think he has authority to issue a, another notice of violation if um, this board determines that violations exist beyond what were covered within the, in the first NLV. 
Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. I, I think I said that. Um, so in terms of the exist, in terms of if there are new violations, which he has currently found there are none, um, uh, but if the board determines otherwise, I think he does have the authority to issue additional NOB. I don't think the board can order him to, but I think the practical effect is if the board determines that there's a violation, the next step would be for Alex to to take the board's decision, but it would be Alex who would be issuing an NOB, not the board. Yeah. In, in that instance, again, I don't want to get ahead of any decision, but but that would be the next step. Do you have anything further, Attorney Dixon? Uh, not at this point, thank you, Chair. Okay. Did you want uh, Did you want the achievers to, uh, to have any questions answered? Only if they have really burning questions to ask. Um, I I just need to state the importance of why I I think it's important to get the um, the activity with the um, the firewood on the books on a notice of violation, because it's very clear that that activity most definitely takes place on site next door over there. It's all day relentless. So that's why I think it's important that that notice of violation gets put on the books so that the selectmen um, can speak to that. And I would just say to that, that um, the disagreement would be, I feel it already has been. That would be considered part of the existing contractor use that's in violation. But Alex, I mean, Nicole has been on the record repeatedly saying that it's not part of the contractor use. She's asserting that it's a personal, uh, for personal use. I think like we talked about in. before. Yeah. So. yeah. I think it sounds like the disagree. I think I can understand where I think the uh, crossing paths here. What, I think what Alex is saying is it's it's a violation in the sense that although they have their conditional use approval, they do not have their site plan approval. So in in that sense, it's a violation, right? Um, and so they have to have a site plan for approval not only because the conditional use ap uh, approval made a condition of that approval. So it is the condition of approval. They go get site plan review, but the site plan review ordinance also requires site plan review uh, approval for both non-residential structure structures and also changes of use. So that's the existing violation. That's what's in front of the planning board. As you noted, it's, it, it has not been, yet been complete. So that's the thing, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, Alex, I think that's what you mean when you say it's in violation. But what yes, you didn't that, find, yeah. and correct me, yeah, go ahead, yeah. No, that's correct, that, that, that's what I was. Okay, so Attorney Wagner, next step. Sure. Uh, so at this point, I suggest that you open it up to uh, public comment. Very good. So we will do that. Uh, we will open up to public comment. Uh, is there anyone here that would like to speak in favor of this application? Yes, Luann Levitre. Uh, and can I get your address, please? Yep, 370 Webbs Mills Road. And I am the butter. Okay, very good. And um, I am in absolute support of the Cheevers and their allegations and the facts that were brought forth by their attorney. I think that since 2015, everything that's been allowed to go on that property, whether it's firewood processing, trucks, excavation, filling in of wetlands, whatever, has been unpermitted, unregulated, um, and they have pushed everything. Um, the sterrets themselves have put roadblock down after roadblock after roadblock, non-compliance to everything that has been done to try to get them in compliance. They have done nothing that has been asked of them to do, and they are continued to extend their business to the point now that they are processing firewood. Initially, they were not fire processing firewood at the original ZBA conditional use.
permit. They've just, they never went through the planning board to get their um, site plan. And they've just extended the business and extended the business and extended the business all out of compliance and all without permits, including the addition of a fuel tank and multiple more buildings and more equipment. And, you know, my question would be, I don't know. I mean, we burn firewood and I have a big house and I burn about four cords a year. And when we split, cut and split wood, we have 25 acres. We had a little log splitter. We didn't have a firewood processor. That's a very different process than splitting wood. And um, my question also would be if they, they keep saying it's not in the business, I'd like to know who purchased the processor. I suspect the business purchased it. So, you know, it just to me seems like we have tried, this is a rural residential area. We have tried very hard to get them and be patient with them to comply to the rules and regulations. I comply to the rules and regulations of the town and they just seem to not have any um, interest in comp doing anything complying with it. And so my, my feeling is, you know, who's gonna hold their feet to the fire to really get this taken care of? Because in the meantime, all of the rest of us are living with this on a daily basis. And I think that seems a little unfair being that this is a rural residential area. I guarantee you, my property value has gone down due to that site sitting there. It's horrendous. You all saw the condition of the site. Um, I have concerns about the water, the wetlands and multiple other things. And the, you know, I have, the site plan review talks about stabilizing and improving property values and preventing blighted areas and thus increased tax revenues. That is a blighted area sitting in a residential area. The other thing is a commercial result should result in a visually pleasing and cohesive village-like atmosphere. That is not a village-like atmosphere. That's all I have, thank you. Uh, this is John Levitri, may I sign in now? I'm sorry, I, I, I somehow no. I've lost you. Are you still there? Uh, okay. We sure I went mute, uh, but yes. Yeah, yeah, well, you might have went, oh my God, here he comes. Um, so it, it, I wanted to hit on a point my wife said, which is I have, of all the, the abutters, my wife and I have the longest piece of uh, uh, abutment to that property. When we bought our property, we bought it. Came, we bought first the front piece along 85. Then additionally, we bought the back piece because it had marvelous views of Panther Pond, Sebago Lake, Mount Washington, and so on. And our kind of our plan was, but I, the the driveway is actually deeded back to that property. I can put a road back in there to get to. We were going to build a retirement home back there. Now, since I got ill, we thought we would just sell it to make some revenue, just live on this house and this property. But now I've got, uh, I, I don't know, several hundred feet where my front door is gonna look out at the Starrett's. And I wonder where the concern for our property comes. What is the effect on my property value? And I wonder if I should ask the town for reduction in my taxes because of the effect it has on my property. The second thing is this notion that there's, you know, we have no proof that the Starrett's are making money Please, please. They advertise on Facebook about a, a, a booming firewood business. The house that's across from the town office doesn't have a wood stove. And the picture of the house that's up in Farmington, it doesn't have a chimney, which is where Nicole Starrett said the wood is going. So if it's not going to the, their house and it's not going to the father-in-law's house and there have been piles and piles and piles of wood, I mean, I don't know how many courts, 50, 100, I don't know, have been processed on that property. Who, where is this personal use? And how can you say, is there any proof they make money when they brag about their firewood business? The last time I checked, businesses are to make money. I mean, the, the noise, the filth, that we, one big building that was on the property that had one of the big excavators in it, 
was the excavator was pulled right up to the front. We were denied access inside that building. Alex says there was fuel spilled on the inside and you were there when I found fuel spilled on the outside. They are not doing the right thing on any level anywhere. And y'all know it. I have a creek that used to run across their property that they filled in. And now uh, uh, Sally has water building up on her land. They're out there in the middle of the night with lights on and a driving rainstorm excavating. And I asked Nicole on site, so you know you were out here excavating in the middle of the night in a driving rainstorm when one of the nights we lost our power. I said, could you tell me what you were excavating? And her answer was no. I mean, you do have an obligation, I believe, to look not only at the facts, but the presentation of the so-called facts and make some determination as to their veracity. You know, I know this is all very uncomfortable, but it has had real effect on any number of neighbors around them, including a, a, a young man and his wife who ultimately left because their child had um, uh, uh, autism. autism. And he would, the noise would be so bad, he'd come running through the woods and his parents chasing him over to my house. I actually stopped him once. I mean, it, it's, I, I just don't understand how we're kind of questioning, is it a business? And is it, how does it fit a definition? When the people around are screaming for relief and it would seem the town's just turning its head going, we got to work on the definitions here. I mean, honestly, how does this work from, from a, an enlightened point of view. I just don't understand. I'm, I'm baffled by your actions. I am. I'm just baffled. I'm, I'm hoping that there'll, there'll be some sense of justice and honesty here. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. And Mrs. Levitri. And I, I hear your frustrations. Uh, or do you have any questions for the Levitris? None from me. No. Uh, is there anyone else here from the public tonight that would like to speak uh, in favor of this application? Is there anyone here in the public tonight that would like to speak in opposition to this application? Is there anyone here in the public tonight that would like to speak in regards to this application from a neutral standpoint? So we'll go ahead and close out public comment. Attorney Wagner, on our next steps. Uh, yep, yeah, I'd uh, suggest that you uh, hear any final arguments or rebuttal from the town followed by uh, the last word for the appellant. Very good, uh, Attorney Saucer. Uh, thank you. Um, I rely really on Alex's description of his process and what he, you know, his investigation. I will, I will just make one comment about about, about the um, evidence. Um, I do think it's important for the code officer to actually inspect and and make it his, his own determinations. Ultimately, any NOV he writes and eventually potentially prosecutes if if uh, authorized by the by the town is something he's going to have to stand on and and evidence is going to have to be put in the record. Um, so I think it's a combination of things that a code officer goes through when they investigate. It's not just allegations. Obviously, anyone can can make allegations. It's his job to independently verify them um, and to make sure that uh, because again, an NOV would have to, would be coming under his signature, um, and any any ADK enforcement action in town would be would be in the name of the town. So the town has got to feel like it it has the evidence that it that it needs to to really prosecute a case. So I I would just respond to that. Um, I do think it's important. One last thing I'll say, and I'll, I'll, I'll finish. I do think it's important. Um, definitions are important, I will say respectfully, right? So because it is important to know that a contractor use is a conditional use in the rural residential zone. The townspeople have voted to allow that. So, and, and these people have gotten their conditional use permit. What they don't have is a, is a site plan review. So really what the, what, the, what the question is here for both the code officer and now for you is what is being uh, operated here? Does that fit within the definition of a contractor use that's been approved by the zoning, the previous zoning board or not? 
so it is important for definitions because again, it's a it's a conditional, which means an allowed use. It's allowed use in that district. Um, if 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 you don't want to be allowed use, the answer is to amend it out of your ordinance. But currently, it is an allowed use, and so from a from a uh, enforcement perspective, it's got, it's important to, to determine whether the use that's being currently operated meets that definition or not. Otherwise, it would be very hard to, to prosecute because again, it's an allowed use. It's a conditional use. Um, uh, it's it's really what is the use is the definition of what they're actually doing. That is the that is the key. That is the essence of the whole case. I mean, that's what they're arguing, right? So I think that's what you need to. That's what your job is tonight, is to determine if what is being alleged goes beyond what the zoning board approved and what the zoning ordinance allows, and uh, or not. Thank you very much. That's all I have to say. Alex, did you have anything final? Uh, couldn't hear you, Alex. I know you're off mute, but I couldn't hear you. Uh, uh, Attorney Dixon, Attorney Burns, any final comments? Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I want to step back a little bit and refresh everybody's memory as to what we are asking for, because I think that's getting lost in uh, the discourse. Uh, you know, oh, at the beginning of my presentation, I sort of set out the relief that we were seeking, and it's really simple. Uh, it's it's not asking for the selectmen to take an enforcement action against the Starrets. It's asking for this board to look at the evidence in front of you, not necessarily the evidence that Alex took into account after his site inspection, but the evidence, the world in front of you, the visual, the auditory, the, the testimony you heard about, your own um, observations from the site walk, and, and make a determination as to whether or not there were violations of your land use ordinance that haven't been dealt with in the first NOB. That first NOB, if you recall, and the second one repeats it, so you know they're one and the same really, that first NLB basically told the Starrets, go get your conditional use permit and your site plan review permit for your contractor use. That's about it. They, they cited them for violating a massive violation of um, uh, clear cutting as well, which had, nothing has been done about that, by the way. That's it, That you know, go get your permit. That was in 2020. It's now 2023, they haven't yet gotten their permits. <laughs> Yet they continue to do this activity, which is, you know, unlawful without a permit, and much of it, which is, goes way beyond what uh, even a permit could authorize based on the plain language of your ordinance. And they get to benefit from that, enrich themselves from that every single day at the expense of the achievers and their neighbors who are suffering every single day. Uh, I ask you to think about that because our request is not a big deal from the town's perspective, but it is a big deal for two reasons. One is it sends a strong shot across the bow that the town should take these kinds of um, complaints and allegations seriously and pursue them uh, as the ordinance directs them to do. And two, because there are private cause of action benefits for receiving those kinds of um, uh, findings from this board. So that even if the town does not take action, it will allow the achievers and others to do so um, through other avenues. So it's not, um, it's a small ask with big impact. And ultimately, um, what I like to sort of emphasize is that the townspeople, they did vote to allow um, a contractor use in this zone, but they voted to allow it as a conditional use. And that has to be given meaning. That conditional use cannot be, it's not a use as a right. You know, you can have a single family dwelling, a, an, a bed and breakfast, all kinds of things in this zone as of right. It's a permitted use. A conditional use is something very, very different. It is only allowed if conditions are met. 
And what we have hopefully pointed out to you is that none of the conditions that need to be in place have been met here. The noise standards have been exceed, are exceeded every single day and have been exceeded since the issuance of that permit and before then, just by one example. So, um, you know, we just want to sort of bring it back to the original ask, which is simply to keep the starets, um, uh, you know, hold hold them accountable for the things that they have violated, for the violations that they have caused on their property and the harm that they have caused to their neighbors, just like the town holds other landowners accountable when they make a mistake. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Attorney Burns, you're very quiet tonight. Did you wanna, have, did you wanna take a minute to add one final thing? Uh, thank you for the opportunity, but I, I'm all set. My, my colleague has said it all, thank you. Very all right, thank you. So, Attorney Wagner, next up. Sure. Uh, the next step of the board, uh, unless it has any further questions uh, of the parties, um, I have to suggest a motion to uh, close the public hearing. And after that motion passes, you can now uh, proceed into deliberations. Good. Board, did you have any final questions? Verbal yes or no would be good. Can I ask one question, David? Yeah, please, Greg. To the, to the town specifically. Um, and it, it, there's been a lot of comment on what's already included in NOV and what hasn't and duplicity of, of violations. And I can definitely understand the rationale there. In terms of, help me understand the town's position on, on issuing a stop. Like how does a stop work order get issued? And where does that fit into this process? And has that been considered? And is maybe it's something you could just give me a quick, you know, a couple sentences on how that fits into the equation. Yes, Greg, I can actually answer that really quickly. They've been given a stop work order. They've been given um, numerous verbal stop work orders um, starting in 2020 and a couple other times since then, actually. <clears throat> when was the most recent one? Um, the day we did the inspection, um, you know, Nicole had made a comment. What what can we do to help this situation get better? And I said, well, you know, stop what you're doing and get the permits. Okay. Um, you know, that's, that's basically, you know, the answer. And as a follow-up to that, are there, help me, are there various levels to the stop work order? This just sounds like you said there's a verbal one that maybe maybe informal. Is there more of a kind of, you know, not wouldn't say that that's not legitimate, but is there a more kind of, you know, formal version of that? Or is it just you saying stop what you're doing and that's that's all it takes? Uh, there's no requirement to send a written stop work order unless the party who's created the violation is not present or accessible, um, you know, at the time of the violation. In this case, they were um, accessible when, you know, I started here in 2020 and the, the original complainant came in. I reached out to the Starrett's and um, said, hey, we've got an issue here and um, you know, had that conversation with them. So the, the notice of violation is essentially a stop work order because it's telling them the, you're, what you're doing is illegal and needs to stop until you get the, either the appropriate approvals or uh, correct the violation. Okay, thanks. Uh, I have a question for Alex, I guess, or the lawyer. Um, is there, in any of these NOVs or site plans and planning boards, are we, do we have any time limits imposed on the, the sterics? There um, is no, the, go ahead, Alex. No, I'll let you answer that, Phil, if you want. There is no time limit at this point on the, um, on the planning board approval. Ultimately, the select board can determine if it wants to move forward with a with a violation or not. I'm sorry, with a enforcement action. So, is it is it the planning board that's going to issue enforcement, or the select board? The select board. The planning board only has the authority. Planning board is not an enforcement body. The planning board only um, uh, uh, reviews and determines uh, site plan approvals essentially at least uh, in this particular instance so from my understanding and, and um, alex may have a little bit more to add on here um there was an initial application it has not been deemed complete 
it has it has gone on for some time at this point. And the last, uh, and I think Attorney Dixon did have this in her timeline. There was a request from the uh, Starrett's engineer for uh, a, sl- a delay until I think it was May, was it, um, uh, to get together the uh, site plan that was required by the planning board. And I could get that. I could have that date wrong, but it was a delay to a certain date. That date certain. A question, Pete. Yeah, I had a question too. I, I think this also goes to Attorney Sauce here. And I think that in our package, there was a letter uh, that you had written um, to try to advance the uh, um, the NOVs and also the uh, whatever violations needed to be corrected. Um, since then, I, I, I guess what I'm hearing is, is that now we're, based, the town is basically being presented with a, uh, a plan, but is there any additional follow-on that can be done to really, you know, um, express how the town feels that, you know, the, these are, are gross violations and, you know, we're serious about it. We want this fixed. Um, you know, I think that you're, you're, you do not have that jurisdiction in my view. And I, uh, the select board does have that, you know, that's in the select board. What you, so, and I, I can understand where the basis of your question is, but ultimately the select board has the discretion to prosecute and, and also um, uh, settle, enter into consent agreements. There's various ways to kind of make people come into compliance. So, so that's that's where that is, and obviously at this point, there's been a uh, there has not been a decision to move forward with a, um, a court action. That's not necessarily unusual. The, the goal is to get people in compliance, right? Um, now there is there has been some time, and I grant you that there's been some there's been right. a, lot, a length of time, but but the compliance at this point, at least in this particular case, was first they needed their zoning board approval. They did go get that. They needed planning board approval. They have not kept that. Right. So at a certain point, I think there, you know, there will be a further discussion um, on that, but that's a select board. And, and um, although I understand the basis of the question, I would say that's not one of the questions before you tonight. It really is whether there's a, a new violation based on the allegations um, beyond what Alex has already cited them for. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions, Fred? Um. Trying to figure out how I want to word it. I'm not sure. So we know the, the violations that have been put out, and we know that it's been moved on to the uh, the select board. That's not what we're here for. We're here because of it's still ongoing, but it's ongoing because they have a conditional uh, uh, usage by the previous ZBA. Is this correct in what I'm saying? I guess Attorney Wagner, is that where we're at? So how, how I would uh, characterize where you're at is that you, you have an outstanding notice of violation mm-hmm. uh, for operating a use without the necessary permits and the necessary permits here with a conditional use permit uh, as well as a site plan review permit. Uh, and that's an ongoing process. So what you have now is uh, uh, appellants have raised uh, five activities that they assert are beyond the scope of the conditional use permit that was even proposed and themselves are not per, uh, are not permitted uses. And so you should make independent findings that those are not permitted uses uh, and are not within the scope of a uh, conditional use permit for a contractor use um, and issue findings to that effect. Um, I agree with the attorney Saucer, Saucer that you cannot uh, demand that the CEO issue a notice of violation. Um, and I also agree with the attorney Saucer that it's not your role to go back and, you know, revisit whether this use as a whole should have been a contract use in the first place. It's important that we don't essentially go through a back door and look at that issue again. But I agree with the, uh, Attorney Dixon's uh, framing of it as look, look at the, I think you start with looking at the conditional use application and the decision. And within that decision, there are, to use Attorney Dixon's phrase, bookends. Uh, there's the contractor use, which is in the ordinance, and you apply the plain meaning of that. Uh, and there's also 
uh, conditions of what uh, this conditional use is, and that gives you an idea of the scope of the conditional use. And so your question when going through these five different activities is, does it fall within that uh, scope of the contractor use that was approved? Um, and if not, if it does go beyond that scope, uh, is it otherwise a permitted use? But nothing to do with what the previous EBA did, right? In other words, the conditional one. So we're just gonna say, we're looking at this as, as their new violations that don't fall under under the uh, conditional uh, uh, contractor use. Right, right. I, I think part part of the question you have to ask when you're saying is this a, a new standalone violation is whether or not this falls under the contractor conditional use. And maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but if that happens, is that then are we looking to um, have another violation? Uh, made up for for that and have nothing to do with it, the one that's conditional, correct? So I think that's that's where you get beyond your your authority tonight. That that question of whether that becomes a new notice of violation is really an enforcement issue. Uh, and in my opinion, and this is where you, you, I think my opinion lines up with the attorney Saucier's, and it's a little bit different than uh, attorney uh, Dixon's. Um, but so for your purposes, I think your job is, is more simple. Don't, don't concern yourselves with the enforcement actions that are taken here. Uh, concern yourselves with whether or not there is an independent violation. Okay, I understand. Okay, so okay. I, will, uh, I will make a motion to uh, close out this public hearing. Do I have a second? Oh, thanks, Fred. So, all those in favor, David Merch, yes. Greg Dean, yes. Tom Hennessy, yes. Fred Miller, yes. Pete Lockwood, yes. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. So, Attorney Wagner, next up. Uh, sure. So, I actually said a lot of what I was uh, going to say uh, to you to begin the deliberations, which is uh, essentially that's that's how I see your job is to make that determination as to whether the appellants have proven their case that there's uh, independent uh, violations beyond uh, what was cited in the first notice of violation. Um, so in terms of framing, you could take it up however you want. Uh, how I, I think is logical to approach it is to uh, frame it out more or less how the appellants have here, which is uh, let, let's take the five uses uh, that are described one by one. And I, I think that your your role there is to look at, you know, is this a, a use that's allowed or not under the ordinance? Uh, and one of the ways it could be allowed is if it falls within the scope of the contract or conditional use uh, that was um, approved. Uh, and uh, if it does, then you can conclude it's a permitted use. If it doesn't, then you look at is there any other use allowed here that this this falls under, or is it as the appellants asserted is a um, unpermitted use? Very good. So I'm um, I'm reviewing the documentation provided by the uh, with the appeal, um, and I am. Currently on page administrative appeal, February 24, 2023, I'm on page five, where they start uh, listing out the, the five land use activities that are prohibited uses in the RR district. Um, first one is commercial firewood processing. Um, I don't know that I should or need to go through the actual verbiage that is here. Um, I will say that on property during the uh, site walk, obviously there was a significant amount of firewood uh, already cut. There was a significant amount of wood on property looking to be cut. Uh, it was noted that Nicole said that the, prop, the firewood, excuse me, that the wood came from their, um, from their business and it was included in the services um so i you know as i talk out loud about this i mean i do agree with how alex talked about it i mean this is an extension of what they're doing with their business you know it's clear they're they're removing 
wood, they're bringing it to the property for further disposal and that disposal is turning it into firewood. And it's concerning to me that they're doing the processing on property and outside because it's my understanding and we can look at it, but I thought the conditional use was that any work shouldn't be generating noise that was can be heard from the from the you know, at the property lines uh, needed to be done indoors within a building so i'm thinking those are some things we got to potentially talk about um, whether or not they're an industrial use you know that's that was brought up as well um, uh, in this in this appeal so i kind of put some of those things out there um, I definitely see it as an extension of of their business. Ultimately, where the firewood goes, if it's if it's personal use, you know, I I, I don't know if that matters or not, but I do definitely see the the bringing in the wood and chopping it up uh, is just an extension of the business. But I'm gonna put that out there for for us to discuss. Was the def may I follow up, David? Are you done? Yeah, please. I'm putting it out there for you guys. Okay. Uh, I think it's interesting the distinction. Well, I think there's a little bit of nuance here where if this is a derivative of contractor work done on somebody else's property, and then you bring it back to your own property, which has this conditional use, and then you kind of turn into a wood processor you're no longer operating as a contractor in, in, in my mind. And, and you've either indirectly or directly been compensated for it one way or the other, whether you're, uh, you know, discounting um, a bid because you're going to take, you know, you're not charging somebody for removal. So your, your, your contractor business benefits from competitive pricing or lots of ways you could, you could be compensated for this. Um, so whether or not you sell it kind of retail to me isn't really, um, I think uh, Attorney Dixon made a pretty good argument in terms of, you know, that not really being the the distinction that matters. It's it's whether or not um, you kind of economically benefit from it outside of your own personal use, and I believe they do. Um, and I just don't. I have a hard time believing that the the scale of that operation is um, falls under like a, a contractor use definition that we would reasonably take into you know you know if you're going to kind of just guess what a contractor looks like in, in, in terms of use of their land. Like a, it's a very industrial uh, kind of grade uh, op operation. And that was my read um, on that, David. And I think um, you're making a really good point on the on the inside of building because they think there's just obviously that's not happening inside a building or a structure. Right. Yeah, so was, yeah. kind of multiple multiple issues there with that being declared, you know, personal use or even acceptable condition, you know, contractor uh, activity. Yeah, I think there's evidence, clear evidence that a lot of that's going on, just the all the work being done on property. Tom, Fred, or Pete? Um, I guess I have a, a question, not just the firewood, but the rest of it. Um, you know, when the original conditional use was permitted, it's under certain conditions. And one of them is not to generate noise and fumes and the rest of that. Has that really ever been cited in any of Alex's NOBs? Um, that's a good question, Tom. I've, I've assumed it's been rolled into that violation of 4D of contractor use. Um, well, I, I think there's there's lots of contractor uses that don't generate noise and fumes, and and that's that's a pat phrase in in the conditional use when when the ZBA issues a conditional use. So, has it ever been actually put in writing in an NOV that the sterets are in violation of noise and fumes and that paragraph that goes in? Um, yeah. Yeah, the, the contractor shall uh, use shall not generate noise, vibrations, fumes, odors, dust, or glare, which could be detectable at the lot boundaries, and all aspects of the use will be carried on within the structures associated or 
off site. So if that hasn't been put in an NOV, then maybe that belongs in one, a new one. That was the same question I had, uh, Dave. My understanding is, if I, I have the second notice of violation here. I, I don't know if you have it. It's Exhibit D. It might it might be informative in the appellant's pack. Um, and then there's another, I believe, NOV involved as well. But um, that I think there's a scoping issue around. Uh, you know, there's no site plan approval for the structures. There's um, you know, unpermitted contractor use, which is kind of broad. Um, and I think that maybe is the crux of it is whether or not that covers, um, but I don't see it specifically calling out noise as a unique issue. Um, so I'm just trying to understand. I mean, I, I know that the, the town's trying to not create net new violations for, for, for that are going to get later, you know, confused or, you know, Condensed, so I don't know. Maybe maybe that exhibit D helps. Yeah. Um, I guess those are good questions. I mean, it's clear that the to have the conditional use, it all needs to fall under those guidelines. Um, I guess I don't know where to go with that one. <laughs> I, I, I guess my thing is, should we be, you know, requesting a new NOV that cites um, number three, the contractor use of noise and vibrations and fumes as just one example of possibly what is a new NOV? Just uh, I guess this would be my question then for Attorney Wagner. Are we do we need to be focusing specifically on the requests that were made of us by the appellant? I'm not sure if, if, if there are these five things so, that are laid out. Yeah. Specifically. So, so how I I would phrase it uh, is you, you're looking to determine if there is uh, these five activities on their own constitute a violation and specifically constitute a violation that has not already been covered in a, a prior NOV. So I think you're asking the right questions here um, of is, was, by asking, was this included in a prior NOV, you're asking the right question. Uh, so, you know, I think you're right to look at, look at exhibit D and see if it's, you feel that it's uh, covered um, by this. And if you don't, uh, and you do believe it is a, a standalone violation, then you make your factual findings and you make your conclusion and explain why you think it is a, a standalone violation. Uh, and so what you're saying is you think the CEO was wrong to say that there was not a sufficient evidence to show a violation uh, for commercial harvesting, so uh, or commercial fire processing, uh, firewood processing. Uh, what I don't recommend you do, but what I think the appellants are asking you to do is to give a specific order uh, for a new NOV. Now, you can disagree with me and agree with the appellants that it is within your authority to do that. Um, but I think your authority is limited to just making that factual finding as to w whether or not there is a violation and whether or not that was um, uh, something that has not yet been addressed by the uh, CEO. I have a follow-up question to that. Um, is it, and this might, this might be a quick answer, and maybe the answer is no, but like, is it possible to, to amend an NOV without creating a net new unique violation? Could we recommend that like the, a violation be clarified, for instance, um, or ask for more detail to be provided without, without it resulting in a net new violation? Or is that not useful, perhaps? So I, again, I think what you're asking really goes into in, enforcement. Um, and so I, I, I would just phrase it as, as, is there a violation, you know, and do you think it's covered by an existing NOV? And if you don't, then I think you can phrase it as, yes, essentially we would recommend or we understand this to be a standalone 
violation. I don't think you need to go that next step of say it should be amended or uh, you should issue an NOV. In my opinion, again, and then there's a disagreement uh, here about this. I don't. I think that goes beyond your your authority because I think that gets into enforcement techniques. Okay. Thank you. Peter, Fred, do you have anything you wanted to add? I uh, was just looking at the violations to see if there was anything in there about uh, if they'd issued uh, noise or. Hey, David. Yeah. I had a recommendation maybe to help us with this is yeah, if please. we wanted to consider this as a net new violation, we might want to try to consider what ordinance we are evaluating that has been violated. Yeah, that's um, kind of what I was thinking too, okay. Greg, Absolutely. trying to process in my head. But uh, okay. no, I, I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and so, if we can, yeah, okay. And I don't have the answer to that, so. <laughs> that was so, my next question for you. Yeah, sorry, I'm just here to. Um, I do know that, uh, you know, in the appeal, it was suggested that this was an industrial use of which, you know, industrial uses are not allowed in residential. Um, so I guess for one, would we agree that this would be considered an industrial use, uh, which is stated that uh, industrial use is the making of goods and articles by hand or machinery, including assembly, fabrication, finishing, packaging, and processing. Thoughts? <laughs> I'm happy to share my thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, please. Uh, yeah, I, I, I put that out there for thoughts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I believe it's it's it would be industrial use. Yeah. I agree. I think it's industrial use as well. Tom. Uh, I'll I'll hold off on the opinion. I guess. I... Okay. Um. Yeah. It... So help, help me understand uh, as person has to write up your decision. Help, help me understand what what are the what are the facts you're finding that that's a, that meet that definition of industrial use that you just read. You know what what are the aspects of the operation? Is it the volume? Is it the scale? And you know what yeah. are that's based on the photos you've seen or the testimony. Yeah, I think the way it was. I'll, I'll share my thoughts first, and then Pete, you can you can chime in. But in terms of where, how I landed, where I landed is it, it, the way it was described as a derivative of uh, uh, a commercial enterprise that was then processed at an industrial scale. Um, I think is kind of you have to classify it as something, and I think industrial fits the best the best use for it. Um, it's just a giant piece of machinery. There's tons of wood. Um, the house that was that was the explanation when we were on the site walk that, that was, you know, the evidence that was provided by the appellant of the proposed house that was the, the destination of this for personal use doesn't add up. It's inconsistency with um, kind of the information we were provided by the landowner. So all of those, all of those reasons kind of an aggregate make me think that it's, it's um, industrial use. <laughs> And I, I would agree with that as well. And in, in fact, that I mean, I process firewood myself for my own home. And the scale that we saw during the site uh, visit was way exceeds that. So, it, you know, a, a large scale operation is definitely not first, just in my opinion, it's definitely not just personal use. Um, it's, it's industrial use. Now, let me just uh, throw this out there. If, if, if these goods, if this firewood, the goods and articles is not being sold, but donated, does that make a difference? No. Not to I mean, me, it, it doesn't. I believe they're benefiting from it either way. Uh, I, I, there's no evidence that they're selling it kind of as a retail uh, or wholesale operation even, but even if they weren't, I think they're benefiting it on the other side. They, it was very clearly explained to us as a, as a, something that was kind of a, comes from their commercial uh, uh, operation. And I think once you bring it home and start processing it in, in, a, in an industrial manner, it's like, it's no longer a contractor doing work on somebody else's property. Right. right. 
Yeah, providing it. What about you, David? Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I, I, I mean, it's clearly coming from um, job, you know, it's coming from work that they're doing as a contractor, but then it's getting processed on property uh, in a significant scale. Um, so they are getting benefit of it. So am I interpreting what the three of you so far have said right to say that you, you think it's an industrial use uh, and specifically it's the, the the scale of the activity that's occurring and is what uh, leads you to conclude that it's industrial use. And I think what you've, you've partially said out loud, but partially has been explicit is that there is a, and I think Greg, you hit on this at the beginning that, that you think there is a contractor uses, you know, activities that you're doing on other property, and then the contractor use that happens on this property itself is, is of a, it has to be, you know, directly related to the other work you're doing. And you see this firewood process as it's an additional step beyond that. And that's evidenced by the scale and activity of what's taking place. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and I, therefore, I also, it's not part of contractor use. Correct. Yeah. I would also say or add to that that the uh, the scale of it increases the amount of noise and disruption. Um, I mean, my my little wood splitter would not bother the neighbors for more than a couple hours a week. This is something that's going to be running and you know continuously for long periods of time, creating a lot of noise, and that's above and beyond personal use. Yeah, I think that's what I pointed to is the inconsistency with the explanation of personal use. I mean, it's fine to have personal use. It's fine to have a lot of personal use. That's not the issue. But when asked, like, where does that person like, like just talking, you know, narrative wise, how you use it in a personal manner, none of the facts, but none of the explanation supports the, well, the evidence that we saw and the evidence that's been prevented, presented to us. So I think that that's a pretty meaningful additional uh, piece that I'm using to kind of you know, I would have it a, you know, a different story if it's like, you know, we have, oh, well, we have a lot of personal use and here's what it is. And it's like, oh, okay, that's, that's interesting. But this is like my father-in-law, we were told our fa her father-in-law, his or her father-in-law uses it. Um, I find the, the the house that was presented to us as, as, you know, evidence of that unlikely to be a, a, a valid explanation for personal use. Yeah. And the, the photo, I don't I'm assuming, I don't know if it was from Instagram or what, but it's where the I show them doing some harvesting of trees, cutting of trees and, you know, hashtag wood cutting, hashtag logging, hashtag ex excavator. So, I mean, they're sort of advertising it as logging, which is a significant amount of wood. So, uh, yeah, to, uh, who, uh, Tom, uh, Fred, uh, Pete, any kind of further thoughts on this one? No, I'll just say, um, having not been on the site walk, unfortunately, um, I'm letting you guys kind of take the lead on this, but I'm, I'm definitely supporting <clears throat> Greg's opinion that this is beyond just contractor, go to, to a site, tear some trees down and haul them off to Hancock Lumber and or, or whatever. They're, it, they have their own industrial process, it sounds like for converting it into firewood so yeah and, and the photos that were provided to us tom are are very accurate to what we saw on site so actually the the photos that were provided to us had additional of those tayoga bags um, visible so and just to be clear tom you you did review the uh the site walk report right yes and yeah and the 75 pages of the pellet testimony, yes. All Come on, that that's stuff. a light read compared to what you guys are used to. Yeah, exactly. Yep. At least you don't have to read it three more times. <laughs> well, yet. <laughs> so we all, it sounds like we're all sort of in agreement that uh, this is an industrial use, which goes be goes above and beyond what a contractor use would be. What is that? Yeah. So I don't really know how we sort of move forward with this attorney Wagner. I mean, we 
we we see where this can be in industrial use. Uh, you know, we would suggest to Alex that, that perhaps a, an additional review of the site would be in order with with this recommendation, or at least our opinion. I don't really know you know how to frame that or move forward. Mm. With so um, I guess what I would suggest is a motion that based on these findings, uh, I move that the firewood processing is not a contractor conditional use and is an industrial use, which is not permitted in the rural residential district. And uh, this is a new violation, which has not been uh, cited yet by the code enforcement officer. So moved. Second. Do we have any further discussion board? All those in favor? Uh, David Murch, yes. Greg Dean, yes. Tom Hennessy, yes. Ben Miller, yes. B. Lockwood, yes. Fine. Okay, so that was unanimous. Uh, now, David, you, you did use a word that I didn't use, uh, which is a recommendation. Uh, and the uh, appellants have uh, specifically asked that you, uh, let me just use their own words. So, make a finding that it's um, not a contractor use and is prohibited in the rural residential district, which you did. Um, they also request that you direct the board to issue a third notice of violation accompanied by a stop work order um, uh, for this use. Uh, so is that something that the board, and, and you've heard my opinion on the scope about Attorney Dixon and Attorney Saucier, uh, do you want to do anything further than the viol uh, the finding that you just made, such as issue a recommendation, such as issue a stop work order, or uh, demand the CEO issue a third notice of violation? Um, I leave this open for board discussion, but I don't see that we as a board have authority to take it that far, but I leave that open to the board. I agree with you, Dave. I don't think we have the authority to do that. Yeah, I don't think it's, I, I don't think we have the authority. I also not so it's entirely sure it's, it's, um, uh, well, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just end that there. I don't think we have the authority. I'm not sure what the authority to make a recommendation means. I mean, I understand we can't compel enforcement actions. That's kind of what I was, what I was getting at. So I, yeah. I don't know the legal nuance right. there. So I'll leave it as we don't have the authority. <laughs> Yeah, I, I kind of looking at as the board based on five, five individuals is of the opinion that um, and then, yeah, so I don't, know, I don't see that we take it any further outside of what we just agreed upon. I agree. Tom, I'm not saying okay. unanimous feelings on that. I just want to Pete, Tom, Fred. I'm okay with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. I, think I, I do have one question, though, and that is that uh, one of the things that the appellant is asking us is specifically for a stop work order. Alex testified that he has provided stop work orders, but that they've been pretty much all verbal. Um, do we need any clarification or enforcement of that work order? Again, I don't think we're in a, a jurisdiction to do that. Yeah, I don't think we can force it. I'm just, I guess, uh, yeah, I, asking if there's another, is that something we could just recommend or not? Yeah, I thought that came in conjunction with the notice of violation, but I could be wrong. But ultimately, I, don't, I mean, are you in agreement? Pete, that we move forward with this as a recommendation and leave it at that? Yes. Okay. I forget, did we get, was this unanimous? I forget, did we get comment from Tom? Can, can, I, can, can I just ask what, what, what is the attorney Wagner's uh, response onto that? Well, so, so I agree with the, uh, the conclusion you've all reached that you, you don't have authority to order the CEO to do anything. Um, I, I guess, and maybe I'm being inconsistent with my past statements, I'm not sure, uh, but I, 
a recommendation. I, I don't see a harm if, if you want to phrase it, uh, phrase it in some way as a recommendation, or, or I, perhaps maybe I, I'd be more comfortable with how David phrases it, uh, sort of, as we see it, this is a standalone violation that warrants a new NOV. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm comfortable, you know, I, I don't have as much of an issue with that as I do with a, you know, an order remanding something requiring an NOV. Uh, so right. And I don't need a new vote on this, but if the sense of the board is that you, you'd like the decision to reflect a quote recommendation of a new NOB, um, and, and that's what the board wants, I can certainly track that. I agree with that. Greg, I'm, I, mean, I, I think I'm happy with it as we see it. Yeah. <laughs> so. I think it's implied in Alex is that the Alex's enforcement's up to him and you know he understands he's here he, he's going to yep. see the, the results of this and I, I think if he wants to create a new NOV it's in his purview so you know I, I whether or not we say we recommend it or not I don't I don't think there's much of a distinction I think we've done what we have kind of the authority to do and and you know at the end of the day I think he'll take that into consideration with all the all the other enforcement decisions he makes Do you have any attorney Wagner that we that we uh no nope, yep so what I'm hearing is is you like the motion as it passed which is basically this is how the board sees it uh, and this is our conclusion uh and uh we'll just leave it implicit in that as a is a recommendation for the CEO to take another look yep I like that okay uh, <coughs> so I guess we move on to number two uh, earth moving excavation mineral extraction um, from Alex's review of the property he didn't see any evidence that they were um, doing any processing of um, the materials there um, I don't recall seeing any evidence of processing of material I did see we did observe you know mounds of rocks but um not a huge you know several piles of it which i could see that being brought in uh for subsequent use at job sites which was my understanding of it um but i would agree with alex's assessment that the uh the ordinance item cited for mineral extraction was actual removal of of items uh, from the property, but I don't, I don't necessarily see that there's something here, uh, but I'd love to hear what you guys have to say about this. Um, yeah, I, I think on this one, it's much harder to, I, I, unfortunately, or fortunately, I, I, for whatever it may be worth, it, like, it's very hard to d determine with the snow coverage that we saw what some of these things are. So yeah. it's just, you know, <laughs> I kind of, inconsistently on this one i might say we maybe we should recommend we take somebody takes another look right like but but like it was hard to say i didn't see a lot of evidence for this i i, I understand that there's a lot of noise and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of use that's in question but but i, I didn't directly see um a, a substantial you know uh, uh evidence you know of earth moving and excavation and, and mineral extraction there were certainly mounds of stuff which we were various explanations were given uh snow salt you know some other stuff but like i didn't see any um thing that points directly to a new violation around around this but that's you know happy to entertain other observations or that, that if you want to point them out uh at this time but i i'm not there i know in violation two it also says that uh there's uh on-site uh crushing and processing of rocks and i didn't even see any equipment down there that would even do that yeah th there was a i remember in my notes a uh there was a broom that was like a moving stuff you know grinder like, sweeper right. right like i don't know what that is but yeah, i mean i mean it was you know a crush is a as a big piece of equipment you, you know shift down and i don't remember seeing that yeah, that's a good point. And this is one of those things why I asked Alex about like showing up and like whether snow he, like he thought impacted his because I we, when we went there, there was a lot of there was actually quite a bit of snow and I don't know, there was probably less maybe in January. Um, 
which in some places we didn't even have access to because the, the, the snow was covering. So, you know, that, Brad, or I'm sorry, Pete, did you have anything you wanted to add, Tom? Exhibit three. Oops, sorry, I'm sorry, you weren't, you weren't. No, this, no, is, this is Tom, I guess I, having you guys there and, and Alex seen it several times, is, is it ever been a violation that they've been filling in, hauling in fill and, and filling in wetlands and the rest of that? Has that ever been an NOV? I think you're allowed to do that. And uh, as long as it's- um... yeah. with, a, with a permit, I believe. Uh, I think uh, Alex said that it was allowed. Yeah, I don't believe that was, I mean, I maybe, the, maybe the wetland, I don't remember. You know, excavation and mineral extraction is taking stuff away, but actually yeah. bringing in and, you know, I, I think there's a cubic yard limit without a permit, so. I mean, I see the vegetation, but I don't see anything with the uh, bring in of material. Just, uh, I just curious, you guys, your thoughts on us. I mean, contractors provide services and and uh, materials. Uh, let's just say they're going to do a job, and they needed an extensive amount of rock, crushed rock. We'll say, and have that brought on property, placed on property for a temporary time frame, for which then it's then moved to the location for which the work is being done. Uh, does that change anything in your thought process? I mean, is that allowed? Is that, I, I'm, based on what I'm reading, I, I would think those supplies or mineral rocks would have to be within an enclosed shelter, but um, yeah. I'm just wondering, does that sort of change your thoughts on the earth moving excavation <laughs> mineral extraction? Again, I don't necessarily think there's mineral extraction going on here, but. I was kind of put that scenario out there. Yeah, it's a fair point. I just, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, we should probably revisit. There's video as well. I mean, maybe we should take a look at the video. Um, Cause I think that was specifically mentioned. Um, yeah, cause it's clear there's, there's piles of stuff. Uh, right was there's, in the there, videos that wasn't there when we yeah we were there so there's been some piling some stuff going on and it's just hard to deduce based off from our observations um i could pull up um here on mute Craig. Yeah, sorry. Um, may I ask a procedural question? Just so we, oh. we were given uh, YouTube uh, videos of or videos uh, to review. Uh, those weren't presented to us. So are those not evidence that we I mean, I, I assume we can look at that right now. Is that? Uh, yeah, no, I, I think unless I'm missing something here, I, I, I think the videos were sent as part of the overall okay. Uh, okay. appeal. So those are certainly within the record, even though they yeah. weren't uh, shown to them. Yeah. Okay. Yes, right. they were submitted with the application as an exhibit. Okay. Um, I think like they're specifically called out in, in this particular uh, referenced in item two. So um, I might encourage everyone to review them if they haven't, but that's. So it might also be helpful while the board's reviewing that to also go over the, um, see what the ordinance says about mineral extraction and the, the definition there.
Yeah, I'm, I'm online. Um, for land use, Article 9, minimum standards, mineral extraction, 9.5A, topsoil, rock, sand, gravel, and similar earth materials may be removed from locations where permitted under the terms of this chapter only if after a conditional use permit for such operations has been issued by the Board of Appeals in accordance with the provisions of this chapter and provided that plans for the following provisions shall be specifically illustrated in the application for the conditional use. Um, but this is the first sentence says topsoil, rock, sand, gravel, and similar earth materials may be removed from locations where permitted. No, I don't really see any evidence of. I mean, I think it was under, presented as items were being removed from one location and brought to um, the star at property, not the other way around. So I'm not. I'm not sure if this is even applicable. It's tough. Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's definitely evidence of an excavator being used on the property. To what extent you can't really, you, you can't really, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's, 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 I think it's hard to get there with that. I think I'm, I'm, I'm looking at exhibit uh, 4B in particular for, for everybody's, if you wanted to look at that. Um, there's an excavator that's running in the distance and it's, you know, yeah. buckets moving and whether or not it's moving stuff, piling stuff that was, to, you know, brought off site to be put there or it's, you know, moving earth, moving, you know, earth from that property um, or filling it. It's, you can't really, you can't tell, you can't really no. discern the, the, the actual, you know, it's, it's, It's not exactly clearly depicted, in my opinion. Um, there's definitely machinery, but what they're doing is not. And I don't know how many people drive around excavators for fun, but <laughs> so you can kind of <laughs> connect the dots, maybe. But yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard. So to what what I'm hearing is is you're not finding a substantial evidence of activity that meets the definition of mineral extraction because you, you think it's too too far of an inference that you're comfortable making that the presence of an excavator means that there is uh, activity that uh, includes the removal from locations where permitted of topsoil, rock, sand, gravel, et cetera. Yeah, well, in fairness to the appellant, there's definitely presence of it's there's definitely evidence of more than a presence of the excavator. It's actually running and moving. It's just obscured to tech, it, what it's actually doing is obscured. And yeah. um, given the snow cover, it, it, like you know, I didn't. I'm not comfortable given given that. So those two things, I think. Um, yeah, I'm in agreement with Greg. I agree. I agree as well. Tom? Yes, I'm um, in agreement. Okay. Uh, so I, I think maybe an, another part of that component, though, is do, do you think that that use, which doesn't rise to mineral extraction, is it, how is it permitted? Well, I think as long as they're stored, as long as they're screened, they could potentially be moved and relocated. Like if, if you were, had, if you had a legal structure that was screening it, you could be moving it from one location to another. Or if you were unloading equipment or unloading something to put onto that property, I think it would be um, okay. But, you know, I don't think we have evidence that, that deviates from, you know, kind of limited uh, use of an excavator and you're saying it so long as it's screened to be okay because that would fall under the the contractor use yeah uh, there's no, i don't know about that greg no because <laughs> topsoil rock 
grand, excuse me, uh, mineral extraction, topsoil, rock, sand, gravel, and similar earth materials may be removed from locations where permitted under the terms of this chapter only after a conditional use permit for such operations has been issued. Oh, no, no, that's, I'm sorry. That's not what I'm saying. I, I, I'm saying like using an excavator, if you, had a, if you had a contractor conditional use and you wanted to store a vehicle on there, you could drive a contractor around, or not a contractor, an excavator, sorry. You could move your excavator from point A to point B from say the two different places you were storing it. And yeah. I'm saying that could be considered valid use under their current conditional uh, use. Now, I'm not saying that their mineral extraction, uh, it, I'm saying that I don't see evidence of mineral extraction. Right. Okay. But see, yeah. What I see evidence of is is, is the use of, a, of an excavator, which to me alone, you could fall under the, the, the contractor conditional use. Right. And should have been shielded, especially if they were bringing in materials for subsequent transport to another location. Right. Yep. So I guess uh, I, yeah, I, unfortunately I don't see, I, I do see the, you know, the video, but it, I agree with Greg. It's, it's unclear as to what is going on. It could just simply be the, the movement of material already on top of the ground. So. So, you, so you're not comfortable making, I understand you're not comfortable making a determination that it's mineral extraction. Am I hearing correctly that you're also not comfortable making a conclusion that this exceeds the scope of the uh, permitted contractor activity? I'm not able to clearly see what they're doing. I, I can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If it's it was if it was the moving of some materials for subsequent distribution to another site, to me that would fall under contractor. I, I agree with Greg, it should have been shielded, but I think it would it still falls under the original conditional use. So that's my thought. I agree. Okay. So what about based on these factual findings and specifically having found that uh, the activity does not, uh, there's not substantial evidence that the uh, activity described uh, here rises to the level of either mineral extraction uh, or uh, is substantial evidence showing that the contractor uh, conditional use permit has been uh, exceeded. I like that. So, so move. So, is that what you're supposed to say in these situations? <laughs> yeah. Sounds good to me. I'll second that. No, you get second that. I'll second that. I already, I already so moved it. So, uh, any further discussion by the board? All those in favor? David Merch, yes. Greg Dean, yes. Tom um, Hennessy, yes. Fred Miller, yes. Be Lockwood, yes. Okay. Uh, Next item, Kamar, commercial snow removal okay. operation. And David, can I just interrupt for one? Yes, I'm going to be time timekeeper. We've already exceeded our three hours, just so you know. I don't think we have an hourly time limit. We have a cutoff time, which, which I thought ten, was 10 o'clock. No, was it's it for new yeah, business. That's new business. That's new business. This is, a, this is current business. Just letting you know what time it is. Yep. I appreciate that, Tom. <laughs> uh, uh, commercial snow removal operations and bulk storage of sand. Um, trying to look at what the appeal is indicating as the violation. Um, it says last paragraph, neither the operation of a commercial snow removal business or the associated storage of sand and salt is permitted or conditionally allowed in the RR district. Moreover, as explained in part 2B, these unlawful activities go well beyond the reasonable definition of a contractor use. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm just going, I'm, I'm, I'm just seeing loading up of salt and sand and, and the, yeah. Thought I had seen storage of large amounts of snow that's been removed from other properties. But uh, Greg, yeah, you got 
did you have something you wanted to say i thought there was no i mean i think that there was uh bulk storage of sand and salt i think there was commercial storage that were associated with sand and salt permitted occasionally yeah I, I think so just my observations here and kind of my understanding is that there was a pretty substantial uh pile of snow which was from plowing um i think i think uh, nicole actually explained that uh, to us um and i think she said that it was from personal plowing um, but i will say that it was pointed out by i don't remember it's in my notes somebody it, it might have been it might have been uh um it might have been uh um uh mr cheever um pointed out that um there was a big piece of asphalt like a big piece of asphalt in that pile um and i so that's just something to consider in terms of the source of that snow i'm not sure if it came could have originated on the property or not based off from the uh road and driveway um which would indicate if it let's just say it did we thought that it did come from somewhere else the question would be is that permitted to um you know i think that's the accusation that you're uh providing a service where you you kind of remove snow transport it to your property and then kind of like let it you know dispose of it on your own property and there's there's concerns about that yep is that a fair summary I would say yes. Yep. And I, I do remember seeing, you know, some sand and salt, uh, a pile of it in one of the, one of the structures, but, you know, I agreed with Alex's assessment. It was, it was, you know, two or three yards. It wasn't much. Right. And it was indicated as personal use. Uh, I didn't necessarily see that that was part of a, you know, a snow removal or, or operation um and i the mounds of snow that were there yeah were indicated to be just like you said from on site and plowing from earlier in the week um, that didn't appear to be any obvious um, mounds of snow as indicated here so i have i'm, I'm not sure i, I don't necessarily I, I agree with Alex's assessment on this one based on his write-up. So I don't know if anybody else is in agreement or disagreement. In agreement with you, Dave. I didn't see it either. So, and and oh, Alex said that they were they didn't need a permit for the sand and salt because they were allowed to have it. And like you said, it was only there was there was probably more salt than there was sand, but there wasn't a lot in there. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any thoughts around the um uh, statement provided in the uh november 9th uh 22 um planning board meeting around no longer providing i think one of the arguments was that you know if you're kind of admitting doing it once you're doesn't make it not make it not a violation even though you've stopped so um the only thing i can think of is it's like you're allowed to snow you're allowed to plow snow right you're just not allowed to pick it up and dump it on your property um so i don't know yeah. kind of with you david but i thought i'd just flag that for um yeah I, and i you know i, I get what you, i think i hear what you're saying when it comes to the the contractor use because originally this was for uh, a landscaping and you know snow prop you know snow business which has since changed uh but I don't know that that contractor contractor use was specific to those services. It was just a contractor use. So if that business changes, but is still providing contractor yeah. work, um, so so are we kind of all in agreement that there's Alex's assessment and nothing beyond Alex's assessment here. Yeah, I don't think there's any. Yeah, I think so. I don't, uh, Attorney Wagner, I don't see that we see uh, anything here that we make a recommendation on. 
So, right, so I have here, you know, based on these findings, specifically the snow uh, piles appearing to be of a, snow piles and salt appearing to be of a volume consistent with uh, on-site uh, snow removal. Uh, we do not find there to be substantial evidence of a uh, um, use that it is something beyond the permitted uh, contract for use. So moved. And seconded. Any further discussion, board? All those in favor, David Merch, yes. Greg Dean, yes. Tom Hennessy, yes. MLA, yes. Be Lockwood, yes. Okay. Number four, on-site operation of heavy vehicles and machinery. Um, so the based on the write-up, uh, starts have been on notice since at least September 11th, 2020, that the land use ordinance only allows for contractor use not having more than five construction vehicles and pieces of equipment that are not screened from view uh, in the surrounding area. Um, Nevertheless, there exists a rich depository and evidence documenting the star's repeated violation of the construction vehicle equipment limitations at the subject property. It also, also bears mention that several of the vehicles and equipment actively operating and stored on site are not even construction vehicles equipments and therefore are not allowed at all as part of any contractor use on the subject property. I mean, this is clearly in the second NLV, right? Yeah, that was my thought as well. It's almost, it's almost written and laid out. In... Just trying to get to it in. Yeah. Yeah, uh, unpermitted contract to use the rear portion of, yeah, I'm sorry, I should, uh, it's, it, Exhibit D, I think that's maybe what you said, Greg, second notice of violation uh, on the second page, unpermitted contractor use the rear portion of your lot is being used to store various pieces of excavation slash construction equipment, materials and supplies. This use does require a conditional use permit per article 43H of the land use ordinance. of which says contractors not having more than five vehicles and pieces of equipment that are not screened from view from the surrounding property and street. When a piece of equipment is located on a trailer or a truck, the combination shall be considered a vehicle and an additional piece of equipment. So I would agree, Greg, that this is the same. <clears throat> Board members, uh, any difference of opinion? No, I think it's contained within the NLV. I agree. I agree. Okay, so we don't see any anything here, Attorney Wagner. Uh, yeah, I'm hearing you all. Is there uh, any thought on the last line of the uh, section four of the uh, well, one four of the narrative? Uh, it also bears mention that several of the vehicles and equipment. Actively operating and stored on the site are not even in construction vehicles, equipment, and are therefore not allowed at all as part of any contract or use on the subject property. Uh, did you find that argument at all persuasive? I, I don't. You're talking about Article 4D? Right. The, uh, not Article uh, 4D. I'm sorry. I'm reading from the narrative, and it's yeah, the last paragraph in there. They essentially make an argument that the, uh, as I understand it, that the NOV may have cited, you know, that because of this machinery, it's a contractor use, and you still haven't gone through uh, the process and complied with that permit. But uh, they, they have a second part of their argument that says, um, this actually goes beyond uh, contractor use because it, not all of these uh, vehicles are consistent with uh, the plain meaning of contractor. Wasn't the plain meaning as contractor as it was presented to us very pretty, pretty, pretty vague. I think it had the main thing that you need to do the work on somebody else's property, right? I think so. so 
I think that was the key distinction. So I think the question is, is there evidence of like work being done? I mean, outside of the firewood processing, which we well, we already covered, like, is there additional vehicle use that, you know, is, is, would fall out of the, um, contractor, um, um, condition. At least that's the way I was initially thinking of it. And, and now that you said that, I think that that's a better phrasing of their, their argument, uh, it's essentially that it, you know, even if it's quote contractor equipment, if they're using it on the property, if they're doing something more than storing it, then that's exceeding the contractor use. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, and then the, didn't we just talk about that if they were using it and needed to be within the building or right? Because of, yeah. I mean, they're gonna, you know. I mean, if you look at, hey, I mean, hey, David, this is Tom. I'm, I've got to take another break. Sorry. Okay. A um, couple minutes then. We will, uh, we will take a two minute break. So back from our break, um, reviewing specifically, Alan's um, comment of Bears mentioned that several of the vehicles and equipment actively operating and stored on site are not even construction vehicles or equipment and are therefore not allowed at all as any part of a contractor use on the subject property. I got a quick follow up. Can we, if I could just draw your attention to exhibit 4A. And it, it pretty clearly demonstrates what I think is the processing of wood using heavy machinery. Um, they, they have like a, it looks like they're picking up large logs. Um, and obviously they've, they've operated a, a uh, uh, I don't know if it considers, it's, it constitutes heavy machinery, but a pretty, pretty big uh, wood splitter. So I, I was wondering, do we perhaps interpret this as a unique violation as a, you know, aside from industrial use, is this now like heavy machinery is a separate um, uh, violation because there is pretty clear evidence of not only is it industrial use, but it's industrial use that's kind of substantiated by heavy machinery. Um, so it's just something I want to throw out there. If you look at 4A, I think it's kind of, um, uh, it's, they're definitely not excavating, as far as I can tell. Um, it's a moving of moving of timber, right? Yeah. So if you look at like 18 seconds into the video, okay, in that in that 15 to 20 second time frame, you can see them clearly using operating heavy machinery. It looks like they're picking up timber to do something with. Um, and, you know, maybe we want to consider whether that falls under contractor use, um, because that is much clearer evidence of, of a specific use. Um, yeah, I'm just watching it. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. At the 18 seconds in, it's really clear. At least moving some timber logs. All right. Well, I shouldn't say that. It could be piping too. Well, could be piping. Yeah. Yep. I guess it could be piping, which in the case maybe you're unloading or loading stuff that puts it back under a contractor use or something. Is that what yeah. you're thinking? Yeah. Well, I just keep trying to tell. Looks like, timber to, looks like timber to me. It does appear to be timber. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, let's not forget there's a giant wood splitter and a, and tons of processed wood also in that yeah. same vicinity. So, right, which we had agreed yeah. was industrial use. Yep. So using that, those one last one uh, right at the very end, there was a picking something else up. Make out what it was. Uh, 
Yeah, so are you trying to say, Greg, that because we have something used potentially for industrial use, that there's a concern there? Well, I think I'm just trying to make sure we we address the potentially what this is what we're being asked to consider here is the the just the operation of heavy machinery that doesn't fall under the use of uh, the conditional use of being a contractor or the conditional contractor use. So whether or not it's for industrial purposes is kind of a separate question and that this might be a separate and distinct violation by because they're operating heavy machinery on their property. I think that's at least the argument that's being made as I understand it. Uh, I'm op open for, you know, I, I, I'm open for feedback, obviously, on that, but that, I think that's, Attorney Wagner, what you were asking to, to make sure we considered. Um, that's right. So I just wanted to pose that. As yeah. Uh, I'm, I hear what you're saying, Greg. I'm looking on page eight of the overall document where they summarize items and um, for item four, at the very bottom, it says contractor use that exceeded the construction of vehicles slash equipment limitation, including by storing or using commercial vehicles and equipment that are not used for construction. Um, I'm not, I, I, I know that uh, in the appeal they provided uh, a definition for contractor that was specific to uh, construction. I know that was part of their arguments, but if I just go to Merriam-Webster dictionary and look up the word contractor, it's it's just simply one that contracts to perform work and provide supplies. So, yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I can't be convinced by the argument that it has to be construction use, right? Well, Oh, yeah, so look, sorry, let me be, I should clarify what, um, I, I was just saying it's where the work is done. Oh, yeah, yep. Right, M yep. more so than it is what the work is. So yep. second you start doing something on, you know, on your, you know, operating heavy machinery on your property, right. does that fall under an ordinance that has, that, that, that's been violated? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. And I don't know that that was, provided to us can i can i say something yeah so in the violations my understanding right is um well let's say in the, under the conditional one they have they have the right to use a, uh, construction equipment right as long as they fill out their site plan <clears throat> so that means while they're running excavators they have to either load or unload trucks uh, you know, uh, move uh, stuff from one part of the yard to the other. I mean, that's that's a piece of a lot of equipment that's that's working, correct? So, I mean, if they're running a tractor to move wood, I mean, the, the difference would be if we change it to an industrial. But to me, I think we're just stretching it a little far there. But maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I mean the the contractor use that they. Mm -hmm. are, well, they, that they have the conditional use permit for is, you know, part of the res, the restrictions for is right. It's got to be, they, they I mean, can't be generating noise at the boundaries. So. Right, right. I mean, they've already got a, a, a thing written onto that, correct? In the, in the violation? Uh, I don't know. Well, violation, I don't know. And in this particular write-up, it's just including storing and using of commercial vehicles and equipment are not used for construction which Alex said there was no limit really on that wasn't five there was no limit on how many pieces they could actually have he, he did say that uh, yeah no more I think it was you could have five exposed everything else had to be shielded and they have been written up for that yeah um, and I don't think based on my reading of a dictionary for contractor it doesn't have to be these vehicles don't have to be construction related. So they just need to be related to the business, contractor business. So I don't know. I, I don't I don't see anything beyond what Alex had. <clears throat> so and board, do you have any 
any concerns about the what attorney Wagner pointed out? Vehicles actively operating go beyond the part of a beyond part of the contractor use. I mean, if there isn't an ordinance that says that heavy machinery can't be operated on your own property, then no, right? Like, what what ordinance? What I guess, like, what ordinance will, are we considering? That could yeah, be, like, and it hasn't been yeah, and it hasn't been presented to us. So, what I mean, I think there's that land use Article Four D. Um, uh, but I think that's about the limitations on quantity and screening, correct? Correct. Um, yeah. And so, um, I do believe that's been that's been. Uh, has that not been? Yeah, that, that's. Yeah. That yeah, was. That, yeah, that's that's we that's the yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep, I'm with you, David. Okay. Do you have what you need, Attorney Wagner? Did we convey what you needed to hear? Um, I think so. So would would you say that uh, because the evidence concerning uh, you moved to find because the evidence concerning on-site operation of vehicles and machinery and uh, does not rise to the level of an independent violation um, for a, a violation for exceeding the scope of contract for use that is uh, independent from and not otherwise covered by uh, existing NOVs. Yeah, I think that's right. So moved. Uh. I'm going to pause that for a second. It just comes back to where they move in that wood. And we talked about that being an industrial purpose. Does that, do we need to be concerned about that? Well, here, here's how I look at what have the board resolve that issue is that you, you've made a conclusion that the uh, processing of uh, firewood is an independent violation. Uh, okay. and, and essentially the CEO aired and, and didn't do that. This is a question of whether overall just the simple act of operating heavy vehicles and machinery is an independent violation. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to say no. You, okay. so, you, so you support, so you support the motion. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. So I, th okay. I think we had a, we had a motion on that. I think we're looking for a second. Yeah, throw a second call. on that. Anyone? You gotta, uh, go so we're, going along, we're going along that uh, with Alex's finding, correct? Effectively, yes. A, a, a yes vote is finding that there is no independent uh, violation, which I'll is what it. Alex concluded. Okay, so any further discussion board? All those in favor, David Merch, yes. Greg Dean, yes. Tom has seen us. Fred Miller, yes. Peter Logwood, yes. Uh, last one on site stockpiling and burial of construction and demolition debris. Um, any stockpiling and burial of discarded scrap and junk construction materials and other scrap materials renders the subject property an unlicensed junkyard and a nuisance and plain violation of article 5H2 of the land use ordinance and the parent and of uh, state state statutes. Uh, I, I, we did, we did see those wood uh, trusses, whatever those rectangular things that you use on which were there, uh, Nicole indicated that they were to be disposed of, but they hadn't been. I do remember seeing uh, the porch, but that was indicated that that came off of, uh, I believe their their own house and was sitting there. So that was something personal, but the the trusses were, were from, from their operations. Um, because of the snow cover, it was certainly hard to, to see. There were, I mean, there were obviously, there was some items there that were indicated to be, what was it, used for other 
jobs. Oh, trying to find it. find it right off, but there was a tank that I think was slated for a job. There was piping that was slated for a job. Let me ask you, you're not allowed to store your own like, is it a, is it a, is it a violation? Are you creating a junkyard? Even if like, does it matter if it's your own stuff? Like if I, if I have a deck that I take off my house and I just leave it, is that, does it matter whether it came from a, a, a job or it came from my own house? Well, it's a good question. Um, kind of going by the state definition of a junkyard the screen capture when they presented it, but uh, junkyard means a yard, a field, or an outside area used to store, dismantle, or otherwise handle items as discarded, worn out, or junk plumbing, heating supplies, electronics, industrial equipment, household appliances, or furniture. I didn't see that, but then next is discarded, scrapped, or junked lumber. And also older scrap, <coughs> excuse me, copper, brass, rope, rags, batteries, paper, trash, rubber, debris, waste, and all scrap, iron, steel, and other scrap. Um, I mean, given the snow cover, it was hard to see what was out there. We did see the piece of asphalt. Uh, we definitely saw, you know, junk, I would say junk lumber. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think it's a junkyard. Yeah, I think. I think we could recommend that this be reviewed again. Right. Yeah. I just think. Yeah. I think like if you store a if you take a deck off the side of a house and you it sits there for a long period of time, <laughs> it's a junkyard. Well, we have an example too of, of both potentially a, a personal item as well as business items being yeah. stored. Yeah. There's certainly ample suggestion that there's like pipes and like other other stuff just just there there's asphalt there's there's like i think they're dispersing of stuff there that could be my read on it um, yeah given the snow cover it was hard to see the extent of if there was an extent of what yeah. was there but they have i'm gonna go through exhibit three real quick <laughs> Yeah, there looks to be like I mean some of the pipes obviously not disposal, it's storage. Um and David or Greg, whoever you guys that did the site visit, were there any like non-running pieces of equipment, junk cars, junk snowmobiles, unlicensed things that you know you typically see in a lot of people's properties in Maine, unfortunately. It might it's their personal property, but none of it's licensed and registered and doesn't run and it just falls apart eventually in their yard. Right. Uh Tom, to your question, I think that we did see uh pieces of equipment that they no longer use that are just sitting there on the sides or edges of the property. Um, pieces that would go to tractors or whatever else that are just, uh, for whatever reason, they're no longer in use. Okay. Yeah, I, I would say just alone because of the, the wood that was there. Um, I would recommend that Alex re review this. I'm not going to say that Alex necessarily aired in his original review because that wood may not have been there at the time, but there's wood there now. So not, let me not of. just, sorry to interrupt you. Or were you done? I'm all done. <laughs> uh, so I, uh, I, I think just to, Ferris repeating, you know, I think your task here is 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 really focus on, you know, do do you, the question is, 
Is there substantial evidence of a junk card based on what you've received today? I would say yes. Yes. Does anybody Tom, disagree? Tom Fred, yeah, does anybody? I don't disagree. No, I think you're correct. Yeah, I'm supportive of, 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 of it. Especially with all the equipment and stuff that was older that was, you know, pushed aside and stuff too. It was uh, you know, a fair amount of that too, besides the wood you saw. Yeah. So, it, had been, it had been sitting there for a long time. You could tell by looking at it, or at least it looked like it to me. So can I suggest a motion finding to find that uh, based on these findings discussed, uh, the property constitutes a junkyard in violation of uh, state statute 30A MRS 3751 uh, and uh, article 5H2 uh, of the land use ordinance, but uh, I'll use the current citation number. Yep. Yeah. So, so oh, second. second. Yep. Pick right. one. Andy, you figure it out. David first, Greg second. <laughs> uh, any further discussion, board? All those in favor, David Merch, yes. Greg Dean, yes. Tom Hennessy, yes. Fred Miller, yes. B. Lockwood, yes. Okay. Uh, are there any other issues on appeal that the board sees? Um, um, in my view, you've covered them. Yeah, the only thing I see is I thought there was down in the conclusion section. I thought there was a they wanted us to do something with the board of selectmen. Um, yeah, they they wanted you to uh, also issue a recommendation to the board of selectmen that uh, a rule rule eighty k enforcement action should be undertaken immediately to compel the subject property's compliance with the land use ordinance. Um, yeah, my past comments about recommendations. Yeah, I. I would. <clears throat> I don't know if we have authority to to do that, but I think so. Jerk sure, off. You guys want recommendation in there? You've heard, you know, all of us attorneys give our opinions on that. So I that it's you tell me what you want and I will write it. I mean Alex knows he can, Alex knows he can make that recommendation as well, right? So it's, I don't I don't see the yeah, I don't, I don't see the need either. But Fred, Tom, I, I don't think so. I don't think so either. Tom, no, I, I don't, it, I don't think it's gonna help. Sorry. Yeah. I think we're unanimous in that, Attorney Wagner. Okay. Um. So as discussed, then my my recommendation is that we consider these tentative findings. Uh, you instruct me to write these up and then we come back and take a, a final vote and that uh, will be the um, decision. Or is the board comfortable with that? Uh, the alternative is that you can, uh, you feel confident that I've captured everything uh, and instruct, hold on a sec. And please. Can you hear me? We, I can hear you, yes. Okay, you're back. Um, so the alternative is uh, to instruct, uh, just to take a final decision now, and uh, then I would have 16 days to get the uh, draft to you. I think it's 16 days. Um, again, my, my preference is the first one, just so you have the benefit of uh, reviewing my decision closely. Um, either way, I... 16 days is probably about the turnaround time, but. Uh, actually, a quick question. Do we need to put that to a formal vote, the one about referring this to the board of selectmen? Uh, no, I, I don't need a vote okay. on that. All right. Um, board, what would you prefer to do? We, Sandy's already got the last Tuesday of this month set aside for us. Do you want to get back together then and 
and uh, review it? I would like to do that. Yes. Yeah, I think it's it's I think it works well. I do yeah, too. I think so. <laughs> okay. So we'll plan to do that, Attorney Wagner. Understood. So, what, uh, sorry, what's the date on that? Uh, April twenty fifth, seven p.m. Correct. Tuesday. Got it. So I I can get you a uh, written opinion in advance of that uh, date, and uh, Tom can spot my typos. And then we'll uh, just go from I'll there. review it as well, Stephen, like last time. No, I, I know you will. <laughs> all right. I, I could not if you all prefer. No, I, 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 no, I, I, I rely on your eagle eyes <laughs> enthusiastically. All right. So are we all, do you have everything you need from us, Attorney Wagner? Do we? You... I, I believe that I do, yes. Okay. So I, 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 just to be clear, you, you've made a tentative decision tonight, not a final decision. That'll be made uh, on the 28th, 27th? 25th. 25th. Yep, 25th. 25th, yeah. See you All on right. The... You guys just have to do your motion to instruct yeah. him to prepare it. Oh, do we? Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I don't need a motion, but... Um, How about a motion I, to adjourn? Uh, mm -hmm. We got to hear from Alex first. Oh, yeah, agenda. If if Alex is still here, is if he's done anything. No. I thought this was a special. No, but it appears Alex has nothing. Yeah, no, I think he's coming back. Uh, maybe. See a blank screen, but no name. There he is. And I can't I hear know. you. There we go. Oh, no. Can't hear you. Might be the How about now? Yep. Better. Yep. Excellent. Uh, I have nothing to say. <laughs> okay. Right. <laughs> All that. Um, yeah, no, I don't really have anything uh, significant to update you guys on. Um, uh, I, ordinances, I don't think you guys had anything um, this year that was specific to ZBA. So, yeah, no, we're, we're in good shape. Actually, real quick, Alex, they, they talked about removing sort of that lesser restriction on variances in the shoreland. Is that happening? Um, well, we actually, we have Phil here. Um, he actually had a conversation with the state, um, but it doesn't sound like anything's going to be changing. It's gonna require an update to chapter 1000 uh, okay. before we see a change on that, uh, which, uh, I mean, it's been since I think 2015 was the last substantial update. So, um, you know, we, we probably got one coming, but I haven't heard anything. Okay. Just the board's aware we, we, the, it got passed that you could have a slightly easier um, uh, setback reduction, setback variance uh, in the shoreland, but the state of Maine reviewed that and said that it would, they, that, that's inconsistent with what the state of Maine would do. They only had the super restricted one. So that was gonna be sort of worked out. And apparently it's just gonna stay in place for now, so. Yeah, the amendment for this year is actually going to be to just strike out what we put in last year. Oh, okay. So it will just be super restrictive. Super restrictive until the state updates their, um, you know, their rules to allow for something like that. All right, understood. So do okay. they intend? do they intend to? It's hard to comment. Oh, you want to answer that? <laughs> yeah, it's not clear to me. So I, I don't necessarily agree with the state's interpretation, but it is what it is. And they have, um, you know, the DP chapter 1000 standards don't include this setback um, um, variance, which is an optional variance. As you guys know, you have to adopt it. Um, I had a good conversation with, with the attorney general's office who uh, attorney, assistant attorney general represents the board and we just talked about how it is written in a way that it should be allowed in the shoreland zone as long as it's not applied to setbacks from the water and it, we all agree with that and it says it right in the statute so i think they have so it, um it, it's an issue i think that they're now aware of it um i don't know if they're going to allow it or not but they don't currently mm -hmm. so they what they what the commissioner has the authority to do the commission as you know the commissioner of the dp has to um approve any amendments to your shoreland zoning ordinance and read right in the statute, um, they also, if they don't approve it, they can actually amend it themselves. And that's what they did here. 
So the, the order, when they reviewed your amendments, they essentially said, and you're going to strike, you're going to strike what you did and you're going to insert something else. So, uh, and I had a conversation with the DPs, uh, with the attorney general's office, I agree that they can do that. And so really what Alex is going to do is just, it's already in there now by order and it's going to put it in just through the amendment process instead. Yeah. So what you have now, because you also eliminated your very um, sort of, you know, much easier, David, as you know, uh, uh, setback very uh, allowance that you had. Yep. So now you really have nothing other than the undue hardship variance in the shoreline zone for relief mechanisms. So. Very All good. All right. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. I will second. All those in favor, David Merch, yes. Greg Dean, yes. Tom uh, Menace, yes. Fred Miller, yes. B. Lockwood, yes. All right. Thank you, everyone. Nice. Thank you all. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you all.